So does it say you you are live? Do you see yeah. that? Yeah. Don't believe it. I've done one today. I did one today. I'm doing one tomorrow. I've done 44 before this. Okay. So that makes me a little bit like overconfident. You know what I mean? Like the technology works, right? Yeah. That's, That's when working. you get that's when the robot dogs start knocking at your door. That's when you got to worry about it. So now what I do is I'm going to check that I'm live. See, now somebody's here. So I want to thank Shelby so much for being here. Maybe, maybe. Later. So what I do is I go to my feed on Twitter. See, you see this? I've got, uh -huh. a I've got an extra laptop with me. So now what I do is I go to my feed on Twitter, right? And I don't see it yet. So I'm going to look for it on Twitter. Now what I do is I refresh. I've got to refresh. So I go here. Okay, now what I do is it didn't come up. It takes like an extra 10 seconds, which is horrible, right? Uh, that's what I mean, technology today. So now what I do is I go here and now I give the laptop to my wife. We've got it down to a science. Isn't that cool? Now I'm gonna check YouTube because I'm, I'm on YouTube also. So now what I do is I go to YouTube. I wanna see that I'm live. I'm gonna click right over here and I'm gonna click back because I don't see it yet. And we did it. Do you know that? You're a philosopher, right? You're a philosopher, mm -hmm. a you're a I'm political- strict, I'm strict about the use of that word per okay. my per my teacher, although he died when I was three, but the person whose books I read Leo Strauss was was very um, he reserved that for people I think way above me. He wouldn't even call himself a philosopher, whereas I would. But, but I'm see I'm so far below you that you, what Strauss is to you, you are to me. You see okay. that? So uh, you're 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 a philosopher. So we're live. What do you think about that? You got to think All about right. that. All right. It's exciting. Yeah. It's exciting. So there are people joining us, and um, I want to introduce yourself in just a moment, right? First, okay. I'm going to ask you a question. You see that? Thank you so much, Bo Bo Bo, for being here. And I saw you earlier today. I did an I do an investor series, and uh, the right. investor series we were discussing China with China baseball. Oh, I got to turn down my music, right? I got to turn down my music. Bo 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 is here, and they say it's live. And uh, as a philosopher, you must know who that's a picture of, right? Do you know who they have an image of that? Do you know who that is? Uh, it kind of looks like Tom Cruise as Maverick from uh, Top Gun to me. America's greatest actor. <laughs> he is. He's America's. Is think, that about right? is that right? think about it for a while. Think about it. He's America's greatest actor and he's our finest diplomat. He truly is. Um, and he's got a great singing voice. I don't know if you saw School of Rock, but he's really. Was it School of Rock? Oh, but he's so good. He's so talented. It wasn't. Nancy, find out what the movie. I'm going to ask Nancy, like, she's a. Uh, like she works me or something, Nancy. Find out what movie that was. So, okay. thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited about this. I reached out to you because I'm so excited about this. So, would you be kind enough to uh, to introduce yourself? Would that be all right? Sure. Uh, my name is Michael Anton. I am a lecturer at Hillsdale College on the Washington D.C. campus of Hillsdale College, which so the college itself is based in Hillsdale, Michigan, which is the south central, a very rural part of the state. Uh, about two hours from Detroit, and it's an old college. goes back to 1844. was founded by, um, as it's a it's a non denominational re Christian religious college. was founded by basically abolitionists and reverends and and and, and, so, and so on before there was a Republican Party. But the Republican Party was founded in 1854, so 10 years after the college was founded in a nearby, in a, in a place very nearby in uh, Jackson or just outside of Jackson, Michigan, there is an ancient tree. I think it's an oak, which is considered to be the site of the founding of the Republican Party, where some people got together and, you know, signed some papers or whatever. I've I've seen the tree. I've been taken there by friends. Uh, I cannot vouch for the story that that is the spot where the Republican Party was founded, but uh, I want to believe. Um, so anyway, it's a private, uh, small liberal arts college, been around since 1844. And uh, it has a presence in D.C. where we have undergraduate students come every semester who yeah, it's sort of their semester abroad, if you will. And then uh, we just started about a year ago, a, a graduate program for people who live in DC and go want to go to night school. So I teach in both of those programs. 
That's awesome. And I reached out to you, right? I reached out when I heard you are, uh, I don't know what the right term is, right? But uh, I read a lot of Machiavelli, a lot, okay. of, a lot of Machiavelli. And uh, Nancy, do I read a lot of Machiavelli? Watch. <laughs> I, read a, I would don't say- Don't let it interrupt you. I even go to sleep listening to sometimes the audio like lectures on it, but I don't speak Italian. So I've got a little bit of like a deficiency there. Um, yeah. Studied it. It's a very important, you know, his writings are very important to me. Studied a lot of Thucydides. I think I'm on like my sixth reading of it today. And um, and then I saw you on Jack Murphy, right? We were talking about that right before. Uh, and uh, you were discussing kind of not only your book, right, which we're going to discuss in a second, um, yeah. but, but we were also discussing kind of your uh, your outlook. You were with the Trump administration and yep. uh, and then you left the Trump administration. So can we also start there? Can we go backwards a little bit to your um, relationship to the Trump administration? Yeah, uh, I was there for 14 months from almost the beginning to April of 2018. I also worked, you know, in a not professionally, not as a actually paid person, but just as a, like a volunteer, like a lot of people work as a volunteer on the transition uh, throughout. Well, not throughout, but sporadically in 2016 and into 17. So, you know, I joined up. Um, spent about, as I said, 14 months on the National Security Council staff, which is the foreign policy, defense policy arm of the White House staff. Um, I ended up there, I think, because I had been there before. I had spent four years on the NSC staff uh, in early 2000s with the Bush administration. And so I had experience in that realm and was a, you know, Trump supporter and, had you know, I People found me somehow and said in, in, in 2016 and said, uh, could you help us just think through ideas for the tradition, the transition and things like that. And a lot of it was a lot of ups and downs about it, you know, but uh, and, and I ended up there and, and I had I had I had, a, I had a good time. You know, when you say you're a Trump supporter and somebody here actually is commenting on your essay, which I just recently read. So I'm going to put it up here. Um, and if you want to talk about that a little bit, that would be awesome. But um, when you say you were a Trump supporter, and I heard you talking about this a little bit on Jack Murphy and some other broadcasts you did, was it Trump as a character that you were supporting, or was it kind of the anti-war sentiments, or what did you kind of what type of a uh, free association did you have with with Trump in your own kind of? Uh, I mean, the initial entryway for me into Trump was his immigration stance. I've been. Um, uh, a restrictionist for a long time. I think we need better border security. I think we need better um, employment verification, all kinds of reforms that Republicans either shun or say that they're for, but they're not really for, they're lying <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, and he came out strong in that. And you know, my first reaction was like, I think most people's reaction, which is I didn't take him seriously. I thought this is the third time the guy said he's running for president. Because remember he did it in 2000, he was gonna be the reform party candidate. If anybody remembers the Reform Party, it's this thing that Ross Perot created in 1992. And it ran a candidate and Ross Perot was the candidate in 92. And he got the highest percentage of the vote of an independent, I think ever, 19%. He ran again in 96. And he got like half that 9% or so. And then he decided not to run in 2000. And the whole thing was up for grabs. And for a while, Trump said he was going to run as the Reform Party candidate. And in the end, he didn't run. Pat Buchanan became the Reform Party candidate nominee and, you know, was did what most independents usually do, two or three percent or whatever, if that. And, and then Trump came back in 2012 and he ran. He ran. That is to say, he talked in both 2000 and 2012. He talked about getting into the race and then did not get into the race, dropped out before any votes were cast. And so in 2015, as he was talking, I thought, here he goes again. I mean, this guy just likes to do this because he's an attention hound. And I listened to him and he's like, I liked what he was saying about the issues. Um, uh, and the longer he stayed in, the more I thought, well, maybe he's serious. And so I have a long time relationship with a magazine called the Claremont Review of Books. And I said to the editors, I'd like to write a piece saying why I think Trump should be the nominee, why he has the right position. This was way back in December of 20. So it would have been their winter issue uh, that usually comes out January, February of the year. And they said, sure. And I wrote it. And for the first time ever, the Claremont Review of Books said, we're not publishing this to me. I mean, like, you know, usually the, if I say I want to write something, they'll go, I, we just don't think that's for us. But they, they've never said we'll take it or we want that and then not publish it. So 
I had a, a somebody I didn't know, but who was a friend of a friend, kind of in the same position. He had written something for another magazine, and they didn't publish it after having published him before on the same subject. And we ended up at a dinner together talking about this, and a bunch of guys just decided on the spot, well, we were going to start a blog. Actually, it was really not even me. It was somebody else who thought of it, and I didn't take it that seriously. Can but then they question? started the blog. Can I ask you a question? I'm going to interrupt, right? Yeah. So this is like dinner with friends, right? So – yeah. We're having, and so many people are joining us. And I'm so appreciative that uh, if you were in New York, are you in D.C.? Where are you? I'm outside D.C., yeah. Okay, so you're outside the green zone. You're like in the red zone or something, right? You're, yeah, you're I'm, I'm even outside the beltway. Not far, but outside the beltway. It's not a beltway anymore. It's a green zone. It's a green zone. Did you yeah, see? Well, the green zone is more like the actual downtown. And then there's all of these suburbs and then that freeway, you know, 495 that rings the city. And I, even outside that, you're even a little further removed from the madness. Did you see that Jack Posobiec did a uh, periscope where he just walked around the perimeter? And uh, it really no. does. Yeah. It's, and um, for somebody like me, I've been expecting the militarization of the police for a long time. Since I was a little kid, I was kind of a futurist. I'm like, it's coming. It's coming. And uh, now that it's kind of here and it's irrevocable, yeah. it's... Uh, it was just kind of a, a horrible thing to behold. So I still think about that periscope as he kind of walked around a perimeter. And I think that he got some type of a check and they asked him to leave if he didn't. I, present. I, yeah. I mean, I don't want to be too sanguine here. I will say, though, that the peak street closure and fencing and all of that were down from the peak. The peak was around the, a little bit before the inauguration, through the inauguration and a little bit after where it seemed like the entire Capitol Hill through downtown around the White House all the way to like 19th Street was just closed. It's better than that now, but it's not great. There's a huge zone around the Capitol that is still closed, fenced off. There are military vehicles and people. Okay, so let me ask, ask you a question. Um, yeah. When you say it's reached its peak, do you think that that's just because you've become numb to already that kind well, of I just mean that they literally had closed much more of the city and have dialed that back. Whether they go back to that or not, I don't know. Everything I'm hearing suggests that there's a real appetite among senators, House members, and so on to keep the zone around the Capitol shut off. But they're facing some pre you know, residents are not happy about it. The D.C. mayor, who's hardly a Republican or a Trumpist or a conservative, is not happy about it. So I don't know where this leads. I mean, in the end of the day, the feds can do what they want to D.C. and the you know, home rule be damned. Um, but it's not popular. I can say this pretty <laughs> confidently. It's not it's not popular amongst amongst the locals, whether you live there or our or our commuter. So and I see that Jack has joined us. So that's that's really cool, because I do think about that uh, about that periscope he did. Right. Because yeah. uh, I'm in New York and in the Hamptons and I'm traveling around a lot. So uh, for me, I don't encounter such kind of uh, visual oppression. You know well, I, mean? I had a friend come in not long ago, maybe earlier, yeah, about a month ago, uh, from the Midwest. And we uh, had lunch with some people kind of right near the zone. And he said, hey, are, are we near the, you know, can I go look at the fencing? And, oh, yeah, just one block that way, you'll run right into it. And he went and took his phone out and he recorded a lot and, you know, showed it to people back home. And he said, you know, the real shock about it amongst people kind of in normal America. Like, what the heck is going on? Like, I remember going on a high school trip there. It doesn't it doesn't look like anything like I remember. And when Trump wanted to do that military parade, I was so yeah. for it because I'm very proud of our machinery, right? That's innovation, right? Just like I'm- so, I, Interestingly, I, I was there at the, con the sort of the moment of conception of the idea of that parade. So in the early days of the Trump-Macron bromance, um, you know, they got along really well. And Macron invited Trump to Bastille Day. And they were going to do a huge parade. And it was going to be in honor of the uh, the U.S. entry. So this was 2017. So 100 year anniversary of the U.S. entry into World War One. And there was a major American presence at this parade, including a flyover by the, um, the Thunderbirds, the Air Force, you know, demonstration squadron. And the president decided to go. And I went on that trip. And I was in the grandstand and I watched this whole parade down the Champs-Élysées culminating in the, uh, it was an amazing thing. Everybody was really amazed by it. And, and we left, it was a short trip. So, we, you know, we left was, as it was over. And as we all got on Air Force One, you know, we're crowding around the conference room and the president came in and he was really impressed by it. And he said, look, 
we should be able to do this. Like our military is the greatest and look at what they're doing. It's wonderful. We should honor them. Why can't we do something like this? And he he really wanted to, to do that based on what he saw there. It's like if, if these other countries can do this to honor their military and, and, it, and it fires up the citizenry in an important way, you know, why can't we do it? And from that point on, essentially, from what I could tell, the bureaucracy just didn't want it to happen. And they made it as they just made it impossible. And eventually, I think he had just decided to give up on it. Why do you think they didn't want it to happen? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, some of the excuses were like, well, it'll mess up the pavement, and which I, I, I don't discount because I was sitting there in France watching the pavement get messed up. But thought, well, you know, there's crews are going to have to come in and fix the roads, I guess. The French decide, well, it's worth it because we're proud of, you know, we're proud of our military. We're proud of our history. Um, some of it was just like, uh, you know, bureaucratic inertia. This is going to be complicated. I'm already doing other things. I can do that. Hmm? Want me to tell you what I think? Want me to tell you what I think? I sure. think I yeah. love defense, right? And uh, I love the defense stocks and I love the defense industry, but I also, I like innovation, right? It's like Alexander the Great. You know, I, I like winning and to win wars, you need to uh, have an improvement on your innovation than, than your uh, opponent, right? And I just think that uh, our uh, defense industry and particularly our bureaucrats don't want people to have that type of intimacy with all of the wars we're engaged in. I think they like keeping people very distant and they don't want to have kind of the, uh, remember during Iraq war one and two, where there was, uh, uh, where there was like the embedded journalist, they didn't want to. Well, just in two, not in one. Yes, definitely. So I think, okay, but we're going to go back to Claremont in just one second. I got another question for you. Do you yeah. think, do you think when the barricades first went up that they were ever going to come down? Uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't know. And I still don't know. Uh, I do think that it's, it's, uh, like I said, it's unpopular. It's unpopular with residents. It's unpopular with commuters. I think it makes them look bad. I mean, I think it makes the people who put this up look bad. And, you know, sometimes even the most venal people, precisely because they are venal, they get tired of looking bad and pressure wears them down and they eventually decide this isn't really working for us. So it's a, I, I honestly, I don't know. I, I'm not surprised that they're still there. I'm not surprised at the continued calls for extension. But I think that you could get to a point where they say hmm, the cost of this is not worth the whatever security we're supposedly driving. You know, okay. I mean, look, if you look at what happened on January 6th, it wasn't the lack of fencing. It was just the lack of, you know, there was no plan. There was no I mean, I've seen videos of Capitol Police officers holding the door and letting people in. Um, okay, if this is really a problem, how about just next time something like this happens, which I doubt it will, but don't do that and see what, if that works. And then you don't need this fence and 5,000 National Guard troops. Okay, so from a historical perspective, because I want to talk about Machiavelli, I'm, uh, and, and uh, I see Noodles for You is here. I got to put my cup down so I can say thank you so much for joining us. And every time I see that picture, it's a wonderful picture. So it's a, a very summery picture as we go into summer. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, she says Congress doesn't want the people to feel welcome. As a as somebody who has a very good sense of history, discourse is on discourse on Libby. Same thing I've read so many times. You have a good political kind of conceptual uh, framework for what's going on now. If the elites are just going to keep on grabbing, um, why are they going to uh, in any way give back? Isn't it their uh, purpose now to just take and make everybody else endure? So I didn't think that uh, the uh, the elites were, uh, I thought this was just kind of a replay of th something that's happened so many thousands of times in history. I mean, none of this is new. So, mean the fencing or something bigger? Well, uh, ultimately something bigger, but in this instance, it expressed itself through like the fence, the fence that we couldn't build in Mex uh, to, uh, to uh, yeah. contain ourselves from Mexico, right? Uh, or containment yeah. against kind of uh, illegal immigration. Um, so just the way that it expresses itself, um, you've seen this before. None of this is new to you. I mean, this is what you, this is what you've studied. I mean, a lot of this is new. I mean, I, you know, there, there are patterns that, you, you know, oligarchic rule is not new, but certain things definitely are new and surprising. Um, I've never seen, you know, I got, I, I wrote something that's up today, a new piece on the weather underground. And what you know, and the new left, and it's a response to something somebody else wrote. And in it, 
I asked the question, I said, look, what we saw this summer was the entire ruling class and power structure, not merely, you know, we've seen them excuse rioting and death and mayhem before. Like, well, it's terrible, but we have to understand the under, right? We've never seen them get up and cheer for it and egg it on and start paying for it the way they did. And I thought, I've never seen a ruling class act like this before. And somebody, you know, and I, I, I admit, sometimes I read the comments on my pieces and somebody wrote, oh, Anton's an idiot. He doesn't realize that this is exactly what happened in the Russian Revolution, where the intelligentsia was all on the side of the mayhem. And I thought, well, that wasn't the ruling class, though. The ruling class of pre-1907, certainly pre-1905 Russia, even I would say up to 1917, February 1917, was the czarist, their, their hangers, the czar, you know, the, the czar's regime, its court and the landed aristocracy. And they were not for the kinds of chaos, mayhem, and anarchical stuff that Dostoevsky writes about. So if somebody has a better example of a, of a ruling class saying, yeah, let's go and burn down, you know, 100, 220 American cities. Look, Manhattan, take, just think this through for a second. Because of liberal idiocy that stretches back a long ways, but that really becomes, becomes hyperdrive with the election of John Lindsay in 1965 in New York City, um, they destroyed. They all but destroyed that place in about ten years. So that, that one of the the worst troughs any major metropolis, aside from you know places that just get completely you know like Carthage in 146, we can leave that out, uh, is New York around 1975 to 1977 when it was just was crime was man? off the chart. Was John Lindsay a good man? Municipal bankruptcy, everything, and yet New York sort of realized this isn't great. We got to get it back, and they got it back, right? Because it was still the capital of finance. Rich people, important people, the media lived there. They saved it in the '90s and in the 2000s. They elected Rudy twice, Bloomberg three times in a row. What we saw in 2020 was something I've never seen before. I mean, I've read about talk about history. I have read about the sack of cities by barbarian hordes. I have never read about the richest people in those cities saying, "Please come on in, and we'll pay your bail." That's never happened. So New York City, the capital of finance, basically the capital of globalization, the world capital of globalization and of the disconnected, uh, denation, denationalized oligarchy, decided to just ran, let itself be ransacked and cheered that on in 2020. That's new, as far as I can tell. I don't think it's new. And that's why I was expecting this. Ever since I was a little kid, I was kind of a futurist, right? Why did this, did I just do something to the screen? Mm, did the screen just What's change? Me? Nah, let me try it again. All right. But it looks the same because I think something changed on my side. Um, so I was expecting this since I was a little kid. I, having worked on Wall Street, I knew that at a certain point, uh, you can only, um, you know, there's so much demand from activist shareholders, from investors for sequentially uh, improving earnings quarter after quarter after quarter that ultimately there's gonna to have to be a lot of human compromises going on in order to achieve that. So I certainly knew um, that Facebook, that Google, that the high tech companies with very big payrolls were looking to shed a lot of, the, a lot of that waste, right? Because those companies can't always fire a lot of people. They need opportunities to do so and recessions create that. For me, I was expecting this. I was expecting this from the time that Trump got elected. I kept a log when Trump got elected. If you, you know, if you drop ten, five to ten to twenty or even a hundred million dollars on some spectacular pad on Fifth or Park Avenue or Central Park West, and your life revolves around, you know, spending part of the year in Manhattan, part of the year in the Hamptons, and the restaurants and the shopping and all of this, you know, when Rome was sacked by the Gauls, the Senate didn't say welcome. Here I'm going to pay your bail and also pledge 1.6 billion dollars to your charitable foundation, uh, or you know I, all of these examples throughout the ancient world or even the medieval and the early modern world. I, I don't know. It's I, I get what you're saying that these companies, but I, I, I still know. I, I worked in New York. I lived in New York and worked in in three different big companies in Manhattan for 12 years, and I'm still in touch with people at these places. And it doesn't sound to me from talking to them like any of them either saw this coming or think that it's good for the city or for their companies. It's bad for the city. So, it's very bad for the city. It's very yeah, bad. They want, and, destroy, they want to destroy the cities and they want to destroy the states. They want to, and I've only learned this. That's why I'm so excited to be with you. And then I was excited to be with Darren Beatty. You know Darren Beatty? Darren Beatty is awesome. Yeah, I know Darren. I, I, Darren and I were at the White House. We overlapped. Um, 
for a while. He corrected me on, on Hobbes. I thought that was awesome because, you know, I don't know this stuff. So he, he like, uh, was that professor that hit my hand with the rule. Um, and uh, Paul Gottfried corrected me also. But so I w- was expecting all this. I call this the fastest roll-up of power in history. And um, I, one of the reasons I was so excited for this is because you have so much historical framework just so much of your studies, discourse on Livy is all uh, is you know many historical examples. You have you know Thucydides that I've studied so much. That was the first revolution. I think of this as the last revolution, right? You have Corsaira. You have you have just so many instances where none of this is new. The tra- the um, the corruption of language, degradation of language, and how words change meanings in times like this. How partisanship. Uh, family ties don't mean anything. We saw that during this election when uh, they had all those advertisements saying, if your dad voted for Trump, if if your dad doesn't vote for Biden or whatever, then slay him, right? They had stuff like that, right? So- um, Yeah, or like how to argue at the Thanksgiving dinner table. You know, I mean, really, do we need help with this? Is this what the mainstream media should be doing is egging on family quarrels during uh, holidays? Give me a break. But didn't you understand when you saw that? Um, and I don't know, but didn't you did you think that this that they were trying to distinguish between family ties and partisanship and that they were saying that the partisanship was uh, the, the, you, the the tribalization of that? You have to prove your allegiance to it. No, that that to me does have a recognizable pattern in the way that to me still I'm, I'm, I still find the sack of the cities. You know, I mean, the cities are the, the citadels of blue power. Right. These are where blue power, influence, wealth, intellect, to the extent that we can call it that, concentrates. So, why, you know, it's like, you know, when the monasteries are at their peak power and, you know, 1250 to 1300 A.D., it would be like the monastery saying, let's just torch ourselves. That I still don't get. Right. But the media is saying to, to people, um, you know, snitch on your family members if they say the wrong thing, argue with them at the Thanksgiving dinner table and on Christmas morning. That certainly has a historical pattern. I mean, every revolutionary movement has tried to do this. It says you have a higher loyalty. Kin ties are the str- naturally the strongest ties human beings have. And so any revolutionary movement knows we got to go right at those hard and because those are going to be the biggest obstacle to our our revolutionary movements. So we've got to convince people that to be loyal to family is is to be uh, disloyal to the revolution and to the noble ideals. And so even if that means, you know, the Soviet Union famously made a, I forgot this the name, but made a hero of, a, of like a, a kid who was 11 or 13 or something for turning in his father to the, to the NKVD. And they put, they put his you know, picture everywhere and said, be like him. Um, this is what they're, I, so that, that certainly has a historical pattern. It doesn't surprise me in the least. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, None of this really surprises me, but I'm just so interested because now I'm reading a lot of philosophy. I'm reading a lot of political science so that I can chronicle and capture this moment. Again, the fastest roll up of power in history and another concept. And I'll tell you something about fastest roll up of power in history. Apparently in academia, they're really picking up on that term. And there's a thing where they've always got to cite the original author of it. Right. Because they don't want to, like, get accused of plagiarism or whatever it is. So yeah. I, I now get like hundreds of emails about they want to use those <laughs> words. I'm like, really? That's it? Um, so uh, I think that's pretty interesting. But I think of this as the fastest roll of power of history. And um, I also see, I think of this as dark city, right? And I have studied philosophy only recently and really dug into this stuff only recently because I didn't have the vocabulary or the thoughts to be able to take it out of my head and uh, let it cross the transom to some other people could uh that i could explain to other people right because it's just a it's just everything is garbled in my head so it's difficult to kind of take it out so i needed that language but i am surprised that um you didn't so when you saw that when you saw uh during the thanksgiving where they're like slay your dad right slay your dad slay your grandpa did you think of of those instances in history or did you just kind of uh oh yeah no, I, I knew it. I recognized it immediately. And I wasn't the only one. I, many people did and, and were writing about it at the time. So I, it's not I can't claim that this is any kind of original insight to me, but it was it was obvious to me just like that. OK, so if that happens, then what's a progression from that from 
from your studies and just from your kind of own experience and just projecting out what happens after that? Well, I mean, it will depend on the extent to which people um, go for it, right? Uh, you know, if people really start, I mean, we've seen examples of it. I don't know how widespread it is, but there have been some stories you know, on media or in social media where kids have taken it up. And the, to me, the worst thing is when kids go on social media and air private family quarrels, you know, like, I don't know what happened, for instance, I don't know what went on with Kellyanne Conway and George Conway and her kids. But to me, what a tragedy that whatever it was to have it all have to play out on Twitter, where her 15 year old or 16 year old daughter is tweeting condemnations of her parents to, for the world to read. And you know that just because Kellyanne worked for Trump, she's got all kinds of enemies who don't know anything about her. And are just going to lap that up like kittens milk and enjoy the heck out of it. I mean, this is just the kind of thing I find completely tragic. And, and I, I wish, I don't think anyone should ever have to go through no matter what you think of them. And it makes me wish we didn't have social media to be perfectly honest, because yeah. this kind of damage was not possible to do without social media. Yeah. Or at least it was a lot harder. You can now you can do it instantly and reach millions of people. You know, well, one hated person uh, who's hated by half the political spectrum, somebody close to them just comes and says anything. And you don't know if it's true. You don't know anything about it. And, and all of a sudden, millions of people are going to be like, oh, absolutely, I knew it all along. You're terrible, right? And, and the family's destroyed and maybe can never really uh, overcome and get past that for the for every the rest of everyone's life. I just find that uh, tragic and sickening. Well, social media has allowed the megacorps to be able to displace um, sovereignty um, and the Constitution and instead kind of swap in for the Constitution a terms of service. So they're really using this, the terms of service, for example, of Facebook as this kind of universal constitution. Um, but going back to, um, you know, the partisanship and going back to kind of projecting forward, forecasting forward from that little 11 year old girl slaying her father and her mother and becoming a hero, right? From Boise, Idaho or something. Um, then we had a very suspect election. The certain, there, there was a lot of issues that went on uh, investigated, and there was very little disinformation. Yeah. But I take a lot of grief. For things. Really? But I'm, I don't, you know, I don't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Why? Why? Not for saying that I know what happened. It was stolen, or this or that. I just said all, all I've said is I don't know. Uh, these things they've been the. There are a lot of irregularities. I am not convinced by any of the explanations for the irregularities, or it, to the extent that any have been given. Uh, I find it suspicious that very few are given. And I've had a lot of blowback just like, you must believe, or how dare you, or you must be crazy, or such. Yeah. Um, Not that I've even written that much about it. I wrote one essay in which I raised these questions. Well, I wrote some things before the election, some of which appear to have come true. And I think people are angry about that. Um, and then I wrote a little bit, at, you know, I wrote a thing for the CRB. It didn't even come out until early February, in which maybe two paragraphs said, there are these anomalies that haven't been explained. And I went on Andrew Sullivan, and he just went after me for like 45 minutes, basically saying, how dare you? You have to believe this. You must admit, et cetera, over and over and over. And I was like, no, I, I don't. And I don't admit. And I, I'm just telling you, I don't know. And you haven't convinced me. You're not even trying to convince me. You're just trying to t just yell at me. And so and, is, you know, is Andrew Sullivan, is that a conservative person? I don't know who these people are. He claims to be, I wouldn't say so. I mean, he, I, I, he's not, he's certainly not a leftist as today's left understands itself or as he understands it. Right. I'd put him somewhere in the center, but I wouldn't I wouldn't put him seriously on the right. OK. And there's a lot of questions here. And I promise we're going to get to the questions because they're so cool. But I got more yeah. questions here, and we're going to go back to Claremont in a moment. And then we'll then we'll yeah. get some more questions. But so um, did you expect there to be a lot of uh, unusualness to this investigation, to this uh, election? Yes. Okay. I, it, it turned out to be weirder than even I thought, but I thought it was obvious that it would be weird that the mail-in alone would make it really dodgy and who knows what else. And I thought that, um, you know, I said this in the CRB, so there's no reason not to say it again. I thought that the White House and the campaign should have been way better prepared. And I, my judgment is that they were not prepared. And, I, you know, I've had that kind of soft confirmed by people who were inside or close who said, yeah, we just didn't do all because we thought we were going to win. And so we didn't think we needed X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, well, you know, I compare it to Florida 2000, where I was, um, I was 30 years old. I was in New York City. I was working for Rudy when he was the mayor. 
and we were in a hotel somewhere, some big Republican thing, staying up late. And I went back to my apartment at about one in the morning. Everybody thing broke up. We all went to bed thinking George W. Bush won the election. Wake up and uh, right, you realize it also happens that my mother was running for an elective office in California at the time. And so I had I was clicking just to see how that was going to go to bed. Like I know, you know, and we wake up and all of a sudden, well, maybe he did win, maybe he didn't. And you have the 37 days. But look at what both the Gore and the Bush team were able to do completely with this unexpected thing happening within days they had really solid teams on both sides put together granted it was only one state but trump had you know six to nine months warning that this was going to be the dodgiest election in american history and from what i can see i say this sort of reluctantly as still a, you know I, I, i'm proud of my service and i i don't regret a thing uh and i believe in the things trump ran on and so on but from what i can see it looks like they didn't take it seriously and they didn't seriously prepare okay so did you expect Trump to win? Um, no, but then again, I don't. I don't do election predictions because I'm just not good at it. So 2017. I was, 2017. Did I was more or less convinced he would lose in 2016. Okay, I expected him to win in 2016. I was Nancy. Who would I say was going to win in 2016? Trump. It was. It was very clear that he was going to win, uh, and that's because Hillary was just so unappealing. She, you know, she had this whole sense of entitlement that she almost pushed people to. Uh, investigate the alternative, right? Um, and she was just so unappealing, right? And so I knew Trump was gonna win, and then I knew in 2020 that they were gonna make Trump lose. I didn't know the mechanisms that they were gonna employ. I didn't know yeah. the cruelty. I didn't know the cruelty that they were gonna employ to do that. But I said, he's gonna win 2016. They'll never let him win again in 2020. And yeah, I kind of felt, I remember having a dinner about a year ago, February of 2020. So just before everything shut down, I was at a dinner, just a small dinner, and one of the people at the dinner said, yeah, there's, they can't, he can't, they can't let him win again. There's no way the left will accept it. Somehow they'll have to stop it, whether it's in the streets, in the courts, election manipulation, whatever it is, they have to stop it. And I thought it sounds so obvious, but it, it kind of light bulb moment for me. I was like, yeah, that's right. Of course they, of course they can't let him win. When you see that girl, when you see that 11 year old girl slaying, now she, not, now she didn't just slay her dad. But she slayed yeah. her entire family because they said something nice about Trump or something. Um, so she slays. She's on like all the newspapers. She's a big hero. Um, so if she's already done that, then she's going to help facilitate. Uh, I don't want to say a stolen election because that's not appropriate. So I'm just going to kind of abbreviate it as a suspect election, right? There's where there's just not a lot of uh, there's no detective work on whatever evidence there is, right? However. However, I can say it and- Oh yeah, there's absolutely none, no. Okay, absolutely none. okay. so if if that 11 year old girl is now doing that, then she's also gonna be very uh, permissive of their being uh, cheating, right? Isn't that just, isn't that just look, a look, look, to the extent that you're, my, my own view, this gets somewhat cynical, sadly, but um, to the extent that you wanted Trump to lose and you think this is the just outcome, you really don't care how it happened. I don't get a sense if let me put it this way. If the uh, if the left and the Democrats were really concerned about election integrity, they'd want to look into 2020 and see and to make sure like we want to win. We want to win, but we want to have one. Instead, what they're doing is nobody is allowed to look into 2020. Anybody who says there might be a problem is is an anti like basically that's what Sullivan kept accusing me of. You're anti democracy you're anti democracy. You are anti democratic because you have doubts. And then HR one is nothing but a codification of a loosening and a, or a stripping out of every conceivable uh, measure that might make voting um, secure and may, might might ensure that only people who are eligible to vote actually do vote. So they clearly like the system the way it is and want to drag it more in that direction because it, because as long as that system is the way it is and the more it gets that way, the less it means that their chances of losing go down, down, down. I already think that they basically, I'm. 99% of the way there mentally to the believing that uh, the Democrats can no longer lose a national election. They just can't. Well, now it, uh, so th it doesn't make a difference at this point, whether a Republican wins or a Democrat wins, they're kind of indistinguishable except for maybe some um, Jesus says we should have open borders type of uh, GOP type of rhetoric. Other than that, I think they're going to be kind of indistinguishable. Uh, but I took all these lessons from, um, Machiavelli 
actually, where he just felt that once the rot has kind of reached into kind of the body, the trunk, there's nothing a prince can do, right? Once once the rot has kind of um, um, uh, really invaded the entire body, that it's just a corrupt well, people. Uh he doesn't quite say that. In fact, he says he, he, he says in a couple chapters of the discourses that it is possible to reform a corrupt republic. The problem is the measures necessary to do so are, um, <laughs> let's put it this way, not those that uh, a person with a good intention would want to countenance. So basically his point is uh, it, it requires cruel, cruelty and harshness on a level that usually only bad people want to do for their own ends. And so somebody with a good end will shrink from the means and somebody willing to use the means will not have in mind a good end. Um, he also seems to believe if you read this, his teaching on the cyclic regimes is really, really complicated. But if we just take two passages, one is book one, chapter two of the discourses and the other is book five, chapter one of the Florentine histories. He restates the ancient teaching of the cycle of regimes. So even if you were to take um, take it for granted that he thinks that once a body, you know, a, 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 a body, this is Machiavelli's term for a republic is a mixed body, but we'll keep it, we can go into that later if we want, um, gets so corrupt it can't be revived. He does think that the cycle will restart, right? So there's no, it's not like a permanent down, 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 you know, there, there is a trough at which below which humanity just can't sink and necessity forces them back up again. It can be really horrible to live through the trough, no, I but think the is the the, the the climb resumes. I told uh, Paul Godfrey, and then we're going to get to the questions. I'm going to put the questions up now, and then I'm just going to stall for one second. I told Paul Godfrey that uh, I think ultimately we're going to have a monarchy, and it's going to be like a Jeff Bezos, right? Uh, because the megacorps are taking over. The Amazon is displacing, you know, the DC elite, and um, you know, it's just very interesting. We're we're creating a caste system. Uh, what um, Lee Smith, I did a Periscope with him. He's awesome. Cole's kind of uh, a classist, um, kind of the uh, introduction, the very um, um, belligerent kind of boisterous introduction of a classist system where they want us to know so that we know what side of the camp, what side of the fence we're on. Yeah. We're on this side of the green zone, right? Um, I, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start taking questions. We got it because there's so many here. So... Um, PT Pasta, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, that's a nice picture. I recognize you. So thank you so much for joining us. Was it easier to enter Red Square than our own uh, green zone on the National Mall? Well, you, you simply can't get into the green zone in the cat. Like the, as it is now, it's blocked. You, you can't. And I guess maybe if you work in the Capitol, you can show paperwork or whatever and go through. But everybody else just has to go around. You're just not allowed in at all. And now that's not to say you're not allowed in all of DC. I'm just talking about the part around the Capitol itself. And they've extended the security perimeter around the White House too. So you have to show, you know, some kind of I don't know what it is because I don't go in there anymore, but some kind of credential to bypass those. But the rest of the city you can you can get around in. But you do have these sort of giant blocks where none of the street traffic you can go through. So if you're here and you want to go here, right, you can't go like it, you gotta go. Eh, eh, eh. Okay, and I'll give you my prediction. My prediction is that every single state capital is going to have that. And our um, politicians are going to walk around like uh, Mexican drug lords. They're going to have their own little militias wherever they go. I, I'm certain of it. I've been expecting this for a long time. I know a lot of people who are former Navy SEALs who are now in the security business throughout all of South America, particularly Mexico. And... Uh, Apparently, this is something all the billionaires have been doing for years, and now it just the rock came down into the body. So, do you think that's going to happen? Do you think there's going to be um, this type of barricading everywhere? I mean, I wouldn't expect it in like the Idaho or the Montana state capital. I think some really red states will hold out, um, and I even think that some of the blue states will probably need to wait for some kind of occasion to justify it. Uh, and the other problem too is is that it's the left that's the best at this kind of street theater. So typically when protesters descend on a Capitol, it's not the right that does it. It's the left. It's the left that did it in Wisconsin and so on. And um, I wonder how this will go over with their own shock troops when they can no longer, you know, do their uh, street theater demonstrations in Capitol rotundas anymore. If their buddies lock them out of it. I don't know. Um, I think we're going to have very high tax brackets. This is why I also did the investor series because I want everybody to invest. 
I think we're going to have extremely high taxes, value added tax is going to be brought out. I think essentially we can even get to 100% tax. Do you know that that's possible? A hundred percent. I mean, well, this is the this is the weirdness of this regime is that it's an oligarchic left wing regime. So you can absolutely bet that the, the people who really run things or who have the final say, you know, somebody like Bezos doesn't run things, but he has a veto, the equivalent of a veto over some kind of policy. So if the wealth tax starts to really become a thing, you've, I've actually already seen this and I've commented on it to friends that um, I started noticing the propaganda uh, against, you know, as Warren ginned up her wealth tax idea early this year, uh, I started to notice more and more mainstream media or commentary, you know, left wing commentary saying, this is what work. It's a noble idea. It's great. If only, but it can't work. And I just assume that somebody like Bezos and others using their control of the media, literally, which they own to say, you know, and Carlos Slim, you think Carlos Slim wants the New York Times getting behind? I've done analysis. Taxes? No, there's no way. I've done analysis. Huh? And I read the Stiglitz book and I did analysis, my own analysis, so I could have a better understanding. And I read some of the contrary opinions and analysis on them. And uh, forget about the wealth tax. That doesn't mean anything. That's always kind of the uh, rhetoric that's uh, that's used so that it can kind of bombard the middle class. The alternative minimum, minimum tax is an example. We're going to get to 100 percent tax. I can guarantee it. I won't guarantee it, though. but I think we're going to get close. Ryan Stilton, thank you so much for joining us. And I like that image, right? That's pretty cool. I can't tell. I can't tell what that is, though. It's right? Maryland, the Maryland state flag underneath. Far as I can tell, really, yeah. That's really cool. So, yeah. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Will Trump ever reconcile with Bannon and reclaim the 2016 magic? Well, to my knowledge, they've already reconciled. I mean, I think that they that they put that past them quite a while ago, and they talk. Yeah, I mean, reclaiming the 2016 magic is another question. All that depends on whether Trump runs again. I have no idea if he's going to run again. I, you know. Do you think he should run again? Um, probably not. If for, if for no other reason than just you know age is a is becomes a factor, I think he's 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 is he seventy three or seventy four? So he'd have to be the same age as Biden doing it again the next time. It's just the most grueling experience. Now it, it was amazing what he was able to do in twenty sixteen at I think sixty nine years old. It's just the most grueling thing imaginable. Imagine it doing it eight years older after four years, four very grueling years in the White House. It's just, you know, and then what? And then what? You know, you have one term. I don't know. It's just okay, so look at that 11 year old girl who just slayed her family. Then she went over to her grandparents house because they said they might vote for Trump. She slayed them too. little crazy girl. So I don't think that Trump can ever run again. I think he's going to be lucky if he can avoid jail because they need to make an example of him. They need to say, yeah. Justice works. They need to they need to have the rhetoric that justice works. And there's a there's a very interesting comment here. So I'm going to find it. And it's from Knight, who says we need pro-American propaganda. Yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I'm not um, propaganda is an interesting word. It's a word that Machiavelli does not use. And yet it's a key concept behind the scenes in his books that. Uh, you know, he says in the discourses he wants to revive the spirit of the ancients in politics. And his kind of sub rosa strategy that he fleshes out is, well, we're going to do it by winning over the common people. How do you win over the common people? Because you don't do it with philosophy, right? You, you, they don't they don't read philosophy. They're not receptive to philosophy. And to a certain extent, they're even hostile to philosophy, right? Well, you do it by simplifying and popularizing philosophy via, again, a word he doesn't use, propaganda. So uh, propaganda has come to mean or has come to mean in the public mind, you know, hand fisted lies. Right. I mean, I'm subjected to regime propaganda all day, every day. I try to avoid the media, but I, it finds me somehow. So I'm constantly looking at what they're throwing at me. You know, like I'm supposed to believe that um, Meghan Markle from her four point five million dollar house in Montecito with Oprah Winfrey on one side and Ellen DeGeneres on the other side, looking at the Pacific uh, who has, it was both a princess and a duchess and a Hollywood actress, God knows what else, right? It's somehow oppressed and a victim. That's propaganda. That's a ham fisted lie, right? Um, using rhetoric to uh, move public opinion is another version. Maybe you could even say the original version of propaganda. It doesn't have to be a ham fisted lie. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be all for American, pro American propaganda in that sense. So, I did a periscope a few days ago with Dave Rayaboy. 
And I guess you know Dave, right? He's a he's a nice guy. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. He's so smart. And uh, somebody asked him about. Uh, actually, I first asked him about it, and then other people did. Are the, why don't we have? Uh, our, I asked him if in uh, Qatar, Qatar, whatever, if mm -hmm. there's if there's pro American propaganda. Right. Just like we're an open, you know, we're an open system so they can kind of infuse their propaganda into our media, into our press. Uh, is there any pro-American propaganda um, that is being diffused into into their media and into their academia? And uh, he said something very interesting. It's a little bit haunting. He said, well, what is pro-America these days? What is pro-American propaganda? Or is it um, right. kind of, uh, you know, 47 genders? Um, you know, I, I mean, I can, if I, to simplify the point, is pro-American propaganda pro what the current regime, the government of the United States and all the power centers say that they're going for? Because that's not what I would mean. I would, you know, you know, or is it pro-American propaganda the way, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> legacy Americans, old time Americans, uh, think of what America was, you know, is it pro-America, you know, pro-declaration, pro-constitution, pro- Lincoln and I, I know Lincoln divides people, right? Because you got all people on the on the right today who are broadly pro-Trump and against the current regime who want to fight to the death over Lincoln. Um, I'm not one of those people. Um, in fact, I, I mentioned this specifically in my book, my latest book, uh, that you know, can we please get over this? But there's a lot of people on the right. I'm gonna take on a tangent who are like, no, they don't want to get over it. Like they would rather get have be rolled over by Kamala Harris in a tank than 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 reconcile with somebody who. Um, admires Abe Lincoln, to which I say, well, all right, I, you know, nothing really I can do with that. Um, but uh, that that kind of pro-American, you know, the pro-American that precedes whatever we want to call what we have today, the you know neoliberal order. I tried, I gave it a clunky. I use the term neoliberal just because it's common, even though everybody criticizes it. I think what I, what did I call it? Uh, I called it the. Um, multicultural uh, libertine libertarianism or something uh, or managerial i mean if you think what is what is america today it, it's it's managerial it's multicultural it's libertine and it's kind of and it's kind of libertarian it's oligarchic um you know all of these things that america as it's supposed to be is not or was not but to be pro-american today means that you know you support whatever the biden harris administration is doing and whatever the new york times and the washington post are pumping out and whatever Harvard is saying and whatever Twitter allows, but, uh, uh, you know, and you're against whatever Twitter bans. So that's, that's, that's really is America in 2021. And we definitely don't need that kind of pro-American propaganda because we're already bathing in it. So I'm going to follow up with Nike and I can't really see what that picture is. Maybe you can see it better than I do because I don't wear glasses, but I should. I that should. I can't. That might be a waterfall. Hard to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. So I'm going to follow up actually on, on their, on their point which is, can you have, if what is pro-American propaganda? Are we now such a kind of a atomized, um, are we such a, are we a society that's so torn apart by this centrifugal force? Are we now a society that's just so, uh, so lipstick? I have a little bit of a lisp, but it shows there that we can't have an America anymore because there's just too much of a plurality of a, uh, we can't even have an agreement on what a word means anymore. Well, we have an America. I mean, in fact, I think we have probably a, a more centralized, dominant culture than we've had in a long time. If the problem is it's it is it is one sided uh, and it leaves out whatever it leaves out 50, you know, let's say set the 75 million people who voted for Trump, plus however many other millions of dependents or people who just didn't bother to vote. So let's just round number say it's 100 million people but that leaves 230 million people um on the other side and all the power centers are completely behind this one version of what america is supposed to be um so in that sense it is unified right and it, it's unified in the the dominant the people who have the upper hand all agree with one another and the okay. one thing they also agree on is the people who have the not don't have the upper hand should be silenced but the, they hate the you know, that that side, I guess, the 230 million people and we'll exclude most of them that are just kind of uh, just kind of an ad hoc political ideology. So but we'll say that there's a good chunk of them that truly hate America. And I think I read something you wrote or I saw it where you said there's even a debate now about the founding of America. Was it the 1619 atrocity 
um, you know, what what was the founding of America? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that explicitly what the New York Times 1619 project said was um, we're going to we're going to change the conversation about the fact that America is not founded in 1776, nor was it noticed to 1619 is the year the first slave is brought to Jamestown. But Jamestown was founded in 1607. The twin, if, if we're going to take American history pre um, founding era, the founding of the government, the usually considered to be the twin roots are Jamestown in 1607 and Plymouth in 1620. Right. And how they over time come together. And then, you know, you add the Quakers in Pennsylvania, you add um, uh, Rhode Island uh, as a as a as a you know, colony with religious tolerance, the Virginia Cavaliers and so on. You, you add all of these layers up and they become America. But the twin roots would be 1607 and 1620. Right. The founding has always been used to mean seven specifically 1776. But let us say roughly 1774 to the ratification of the constitution and the inauguration of George Washington. So 1789, right? When the government is, you know, declare independence, win independence, um, formulate the constitution, ratify the constitution, elect the new government. They specifically say that the whole purpose of the 1619 project was that's not the founding America and nor is, nor does, nor does uh, Plymouth have anything to do with it, nor does the beginning of Jamestown have anything to do with it. The real true beginning of America is, is the, is the, the bringing over of the first slave. That's it. And that's all America is, is slavery. So you said something earlier, several times, right? Uh, this is the fastest consolidation of power in history. No, I didn't read consolidation. You see, I don't want academic credit for that one. That's not what I said. Right? Um, I agree, but I disagree to this extent. I'm reminded of the famous line in... Uh, right, let me tell you what it is. It's awesome. You're going to really like this, right? The fastest roll-up of power in history. Roll-up. Okay, roll-up. I'm going to tell you why I say that. I'm going to interrupt, so then you can go back to your thing. So just remember where you were. Uh, because I study... Alexander the Great's one of my heroes, right? Uh, and because I've studied that period so much, and then that period that led to the rise of Rome, and then to the Roman Empire... And Augustus is one of my favorite administrators in, Amer in, uh, in world history. So I think of the period between Alexander the Great and uh, Caesar, right? And now we collapse it into the last four years. So we had that same roll up of power that took, what, 200 years, I suppose? Actually, only 50 years is finally when, you know, whatever. But let's say 200 years. And we've collapsed it all into four years. So I call this the fastest roll of power. Well, see, that's where I disagree. I reminded of that famous um, line. I think it's in Sun Also Rises, where one of the characters says, you know how you go broke? Uh, first gradually, then suddenly. This consolidation of power, I would say, goes back to, in our case, the beginnings of it are at least in the late 19th century with the capital P progressive era. And how that, you know, could builds power in the administrative state, takes a big leap forward with um, the FDR administration and the New Deal, the expansion of the bureaucracy and the expansion of the powers of the bureaucracy, another big leap forward with World War One or World War II, sorry, and then the founding, the founding or the, the great expansion and consolidation of the uh, national security state in the years after World War II to fight the Cold War, and then another huge leap forward with the, with the real ideological framework that we're dealing with now is cooked up in, in sort of petri dish university laboratories um, in the in the 60s and, and considered kooky and gets its sort of first trial run in America in the 60s and 70s with all of the craziness, especially the real craziness. But what we're seeing now, it, roll up is the right word if one accepts the fact that the roll up is like, all right, we finally have all the pieces in place after 120 years. Now it's time to just hit go. And that's what happened to me, it seems to me, in the, in the summer of 2020. That's you can't great. understand the summer of 2020 unless you understand the last, the previous 120 or so years. Yeah, you can. I do. I don't know anything about the last hundred and something years, um, but I do. Right. I still understand it because, look, they threw Assange into jail um, and uh, who's controversial in terms of his personality. But his contribution to journalism is 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 a remarkable human achievement. Right. To um, me, actually, no one seems to ever make this point. The worst thing about that is. And I'm very ambivalent about Assange, okay? I'll, I'll say that and I'll get criticized for it. But I want to know, why does the United States government have the authority and the ability to hunt a foreign national down in foreign capitals? And I mean, if, if he had committed some kind of crime on U.S. soil, I would get it. 
you murdered somebody or, or whatever, you even committed espionage. I would get it in some way. This is a guy who's not an American citizen who did all of his activities overseas. Uh, I just I don't I don't quite get why the American government is able to essentially just chase down foreigners and do whatever it wants to them. That to me strikes me as a really tyrannical power that we should all fear. Okay, so I knew things were going wrong and I see Generator 16 is here, who I know offline also, so I'm so appreciative that you're here. Uh, and we're gonna get to his thing really quickly in a moment. But so I knew things were going haywire in 2015 when Hillary's email server, which I became an expert because I'm like obsessive with this type of stuff. And I was just so kind of inquisitive that uh, I kept on going clicks deep into like that rabbit hole, right? And uh, then we had people like, you know, um, Sundance from the conservative Treehouse, uh, Last Refugee 2 was amazing. We had Technofog, we even had John Schindler. We had a lot of people doing kind of forensics and postmortems on, on what was going on with their server. But I knew when I saw the media uh, saying that I'm the crazy one and everything she did is okay, and then kind of rationalizing it, then they throw Assange into jail, they throw Roger Stone into jail, they throw Manafort into jail. Anything that threatened power, they raided National Enquirer. They, you know, as Amanda Milius in a movie you were in, uh, yeah. I did a four hour periscope with her. Did you know that? No. You know, four hours, it was four hours. They, 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 they broke the chassis of our, of our government. They broke the chassis of our constitution. So I knew if they were doing that, this is the fastest roll up of power in history. I don't care what happened before. I just really want to. I'm just saying it. It knowing what happened before helps deepen and explain one's understanding of how the roll-up happened. I never even read the Constitution. I never read the Federalist Papers. I can't suffer in piety. I have no nostalgia for what was. I'm just trying to observe what is. Okay. okay? I didn't we're, read. The we're not alike in that way. I'm. I'm. I'm sort of drowning in nostalgia for what was. Okay. So my entire American history, I think, begins with. Uh, with Roger Moore in uh, the Mount the Golden Gun, all right? I think that's when like my whole American history begins. So okay. January 15th. Uh, 1975, I don't even, I saw it, but I don't remember it. Was that 1975? Something like that. <laughs> if that is, you're so good, man. So Generator 16 comments on an article. Oh, Moonraker was 79 and Man with the Golden Guns before Moonraker, so. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. I saw Moonraker in the theater three times, I remember. Cause I like when he jumps out of the, par jumps out of the airplane gets pushed out here. So Generator 16, thank you so much for joining us uh, and for taking the time because they've been they've been very busy. So Generator 16 says the 30 tyrants want you to know that they're in control and you're not. Yeah. So I take that as hopeful. I don't think he meant it that way. So for the listeners who I may not know, the 30 tyrants is a regime imposed by the Spartans over the Athenians after Athens' defeat in the Peloponnesian War um, in 404 uh, BC not covered by Thucydides because Thucydides history cuts off before the war ends, but it's all covered amply in Xenophon's Hellenica and in some other books. Uh, the, the hopeful reason is that the 30 tyrants only lasted about eight months or nine months. It was a really very short lived regime. If this, if the wokeocracy only lasts eight months, we should all count ourselves beyond lucky and beyond blessed. I don't think it's going to be that short, sadly though. So our 30 tyrants, however many there are, are probably going to be around a bit longer. I think they're uh, trying to solve the impermanence of power. What do you think about that? That's a good one, right? That's a good yeah. one. I, that's an unsolved. I mean, if any, look, I, I put it this way to friends uh, all the time. If the things that the regime, the oligarchy is trying to do turn out to be doable, it means that our entire educations are worthless. All the books behind me that maybe your listeners or your readers or your viewers can see, you know, there's a lot of Greek classics and history and stuff back there. It should all just be burned. Not, not because we're banning it, but because it's worthless. If they're able to pull off, if they can pull off, then Plato and Aristotle and Cicero and Aquinas and Machiavelli and Montesquieu, and you name it. Also, I would have to say, you know, some of the Chinese philosophers that I've read, Sun Tzu and Lao Tzu and Mencius and Confucius, they're all wrong. It's all garbage. If what these people are trying to do turns out to be possible, then all the classics of all the traditions that I've ever read are flat wrong. But that's what's going to happen. It's not even a question mark. That's what's going to happen. Ah, and I no, not just, I mean... It may happen, but the question is how long can it last? I mean, the, the cycle, I don't think the cycle of regimes has been repealed. I don't. I think what they're trying to do is anti-nature and they will run up against the rocks of nature and this thing will eventually, um, will sink, I think so. Or or as I said, there is no nature. And, and you know, we've been living under, Western man's been living under a delusion for 2,500 years and believing that there is this thing called human nature. I don't know, I don't know, you're so good with that. And one, you know, I'm very optimistic, which, you know, might seem surprising to people unless they've really kind of uh, seen what I tweet and kind of what I say. 
I'm very optimistic. I just see that we're seeing a transformation of our people operating system. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that we're also observing so much cruelty. I think it's going to create a lot of hatred. We're creating an American caste system, which is also upsetting. I just want to make sure I'm on the right side of that caste system. I want to be inside the green zone, uh, but I'm extremely optimistic but I don't think, uh, I think all those books are going to get burned. I can guarantee you, you're going to lose the Stephanus notations in Plato so they become unreadable. Bible, you're going to lose the notations there because the only way, I call it dark city, the only way that the elites can win is to uh, make what happened before never have happened. Right, which has been tried. It's never been. Now, uh, um, the only thing they'd have going for them in that respect is, is technology. Um, Strauss raises this point in his famous study on tyranny, and he raises it in more than one place, actually, but it's in most forcefully in on tyranny. He says that technology has made potentially possible. He doesn't make it a certainty. He says has made potentially possible something that the, the greatest tyrants of the ancient world could only have dreamed of, and that is to make perpetual tyranny perpetual and universal, right? Okay, so there's that. On the flip side, Strauss says in the very final paragraph of his I think greatest book, certainly my favorite of his books, Thoughts on Machiavelli. In the last paragraph, he talks about um, the danger to human beings of letting their inventions get away from them and take control of them and subsume human nature under some kind of technocratic rule. Uh, and he says that, but natural cataclysms, according to the ancients and even according to Machiavelli himself, natural cataclysms take care of this. And they may therefore be seen as an example of the beneficence of nature. So even if the, here's my, you know, I'm not known for my hopeful thoughts. If you ask my friends, like, what do you, you know, if you're feeling down and you need some optimism, do you call Anton? The answer is of course, no. So <laughs> this is my hopeful thought for the day, which is even if they're able to pull this off and techno technocratize or whatever, technologize everything and, and, and instill a tyranny that is universal, it will not be perpetual because eventually some, they will, it will bump up either against natural limits or natural cataclysms will simply wipe it out. And we're going to get to Instavirus question in one moment, but I'm going to just add my own kind of like three cents, right? You like that? Uh, so, and what I what I think is, I'm writing the chronicles of the fastest roll-up of power in history. I also call it Dark City. There's a lot of phrases. You know what I like to say? You can have this one. You don't even have to attribute this to me. I don't need to get your email saying, can I use this? Tyrannies always turn inwards. What do you think about that? What do you think well, I don't know what you mean by it. I mean, it's the old, if, if you, there's a saying that you know, the revolution, revolutions always eat their own. So okay, no, I'll tell you why I say that. I say that, I started thinking about that with the Tudorburg Forest, right? And I just started thinking that there's a, a reach to an empire before it starts coming back. And part of the lesson I learned from history of the Peloponnesian War was that. But what I'm saying is I'm writing the history because one day people will want to know what happened. There's going to be a caste system. The elites are going to want to know because you're not going to have Plato. You're going to have Plato because you're an elite, kind of. You're on the right side of the green zone. Well, you know, when you say that about this caste system, I mean, I, I, I don't my fondest hope is to just get out of here someday sooner rather than later and and go live among the reds and i'm the bluest you know culturally i'm the bluest person you could conceivably imagine i grew up in northern california i went only to coastal educational institutions i'm a freaking college professor i mean is there a bluer occupation you could imagine um you know I, all of my habits all of my upbringing my background my tastes i won't even go into those because they, they make me sound so pretentious right are completely blue but i've gotten to a point in, in in my old age now or my middle age where all of my sympathies are now just entirely utterly red okay and so i don't want to be in the cast of the you know people like to say well you know you are one of those guys i i guess sort of kind of i was born that way and lived that way for a while but like my my heart and head aren't there anymore Okay, so we're going to get, uh, now I feel bad about that, right? So we're going to get to Instavire. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think that's like a picture of like a judge or something, right? I no, it's, uh, it's uh, John Durham, the U.S. attorney who's in charge of the Russiagate uh, investigation, uh, who Barr made a special prosecutor on his way out so that the new uh, um, attorney general either couldn't fire him or would have a difficult time firing him. Uh, do you know Sundance, uh, the last refugee on, uh, on Twitter? Do you know who that is, the conservative curiosity? No, yeah, but I'm not a Twitter. I'm not on Twitter, and so the only the only thing I see on Twitter is I'm on I'm on a few group chats. Um, yeah. You know, always on is one of the group chats. You you know you, you did a and I, I people will send me links during the day. I will typically click on links sent to me by friends if they think it's important. But other than that, I'm, I'm pretty pretty Twitter uh, phobic. I'm gonna get to Instavirus comment very soon, but I'm just gonna say that uh, um, Sundance has done a lot of forensics for the last four years 
about this kind of uh, um, velocity of all these special prosecutors and all these judges. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, the postmortems are always that they're just playing a game of attrition. They're just stalling it out. So Instabire, thank you so much for joining us. Does Anton, that's you, does Anton expect coming vaccine passport to be revocable by government for far right ties? Uh, yeah, I, I expect the regime for as long as it can, uh, for as long as it's in power and it has the power to do essentially whatever it can get away with. So the only the only thing that it will, the only thing is that I expect it to refrain from doing are things that either it, it, it fears will create a backlash or cause too much internal division amongst itself and they can't make up their minds. But if they feel like, you know, we can first, you know, in, in steps require you to have, you know, proof of vaccine before you can travel. And then we can say, you know, well, you know, you were involved, you somehow tangentially uh, involved in January 6th. Uh, yes, certainly I, I wouldn't be surprised by that at all. I'm, I expect to see uh, the no fly zone expand, not the no fly zone, the no fly list it's expanded sooner rather than later to say to people that, well, we think you're a security threat. Well, why? Well, I don't, I mean, this is an exaggeration, although it won't be before long. Well, you liked some bad tweet once. And so therefore you're a, you're a threat and you can't fly anymore. I, I, to the extent that they think they can get away with it, I think there's almost nothing in this realm that they wouldn't do. That is to say in the restriction of uh, civil liberties and domestic freedoms. Thank you so much. And uh, you're right. I know you're right. So, um, and um, up like up up like Benson B. I kind of like that, right? It's almost a tongue twister. <laughs> you know it is a tongue twister, maybe. So, um, and thank you so much for being here. It says why refer to them as the ruling class in the first place? And it feels like submission to say that. I mean, because they're a class and they rule. I don't know. I I don't know what else to. I if I I've got my book here, I can point you to. Oh, I don't even need to I remember actually it's chapter four I mean, I wrote a whole chapter on what is the ruling class and how, how what unifies them what makes them a class and in, in, in the prior to well certainly the prior chapter chapter three is a long explanation the, the instruments have how they rule how do they rule um, so that's the short answer because they rule and they're a class yeah interesting so um and here's, and I want to thank Jay Bird, lots of numbers. I've learned not to go after the numbers because I always get them wrong. But Jay Bird, yeah. thank you for joining us. By the way, the, the, the little graphic there is Poochie, a character from a, a long ago Simpsons episode back when The Simpsons was still funny. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I never really got into The Simpsons. I like South Park, though. I like South Park. Uh, I was a big fan of The Simpsons up through about season eight, and then I thought it's kind of stopped being funny, and I haven't paid attention in a long time. But when I was in grad school, kind of was during the, the heyday of The Simpsons, and all of my grad school buddies and I uh, watched it every Sunday at eight. I mean, it was a big thing for us. So Jay Berg, and thank you so much. And thank you for uh, for helping me out with that because I didn't know what image that was. And yeah. for that perspective on The Simpsons, right? That was pretty cool. So it says, what other examples in history are there? So I'm very curious about this. When you look at this period of time and, and now you just try and draw from it kind of historical references, like little things that you've gleaned, uh, and just kind of assemble them into where we are now. What are those moments that you can think of? Well, I don't I, examples of what. I mean, I guess I don't. I don't I, well, question where, we are, where, we are, where we are now. Uh, and so when you when I say example, or when when he says yeah. example, I'm talking about even the fact that they're constructing, you know, the uh, the green zones, uh, which are these kind of uh, palaces and moats, right? It just uh, it just makes them very unapproachable, right? It makes them- You have to think about this in two ways, I think. One is you look for the parallels, but then you also, as you build the parallel, you have to be mindful of differences, right? So I forgot who said it, maybe Twain, you know, one of those quotes, it's hard to attribute, but you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So sometimes things look alike. They never, they never follow identically. Um, the most obvious parallel, the most shop-worn, but, but the most, I think, I still think the most useful is the parallel with Rome. So where are we in respect to Rome? Um, at, at a minimum, we're somewhere in the very late Republican stage, about to transition to pure straight up empire. It's possible, however, that we've already made the transition. That is to say that you're not going to see a real Augustinian monarchy emerge in the U.S. or not until later. But you could have some long decade period of a kind of oligarchical power sharing arrangement where there is no one obvious figure in charge, the princep senatus which was Augustus's formal title. Um, there's no emperor, um, but the country is still ruled essentially imperially 
uh, and the outward forms of the democracy or the republic are preserved. So you still have the Senate, you still have a house, you still have courts, you still have an electoral college, you still have all of these things that make people believe things are going on as they were, but none of them function the same way. I think you can easily make the case that we're already there, even though we don't have the emperor, but that the emperor is a kind of uh, committee or even, a, or even a, a hive mind. Like I said, you know, Jeff Bezos, this is another great concept, by the way, to take from Machiavelli. Another phrase that he does not use, that he teaches only by implication, that Strauss gives a name to, it's indirect government, right? The best kind of government, in a sense, Machiavelli is saying, going for he's giving this as a recommendation, is not the classical form of government where the it, ruling is visible. You know who rules. If it's a democracy, the demos rules in the popular assembly. If it's a tyrant, the tyrant rules from his palace. If it's an oligarchy, you know the doges rule from their uh, palace in Venice or something like that. And you know who they are, and the rule is visible and demonstrable, right? Indirect rule is what you see isn't necessarily what you get. So Jeff Bezos to rule and Mark Zuckerberg and the hedge fund lords in New York and so on, don't need to be in Washington voting on the Senate floor or pulling the levers of power in the cabinet. They effectively have veto over any major decision the government makes, and they steer the government by setting the bounds of acceptable opinion, but also ex who the acceptable candidates are and what the acceptable policy choices they're allowed to make are. And they kind of, and, and the thing in a way kind of runs itself. And if every, every once in a while it's getting off the rails from their perspective and they feel they need to butt in, they butt in. It reminds me, I, I worked for a number of years for News Corporation, which is the parent company, then was the parent company of Fox News. Now they've split, News Corp just has the print, 21st Century Fox has the, right? But in those days, it was all one company. Rupert Murdoch was in charge. And very early on, somebody explained to me, look, people think that Rupert sits around, everybody called him by his first name. You know, it was this sort of fake equality. <laughs> uh, Everybody thinks Rupert sits around and he's on top of everything and he's like calling editors and saying, publish this and don't publish that, and do this and don't do that, and endorse this, and, right? He does, it's not the way he operates. All Rupert has to do is pick the right people, kind of let them go, and he keeps tabs on it. And if things are going in the right direction, he stay, you know, he keeps in touch, he calls them every once in a while, but, and then every once in a while, if he really thinks something is important, he'll give an order, or if he really thinks they blew it, he'll call and chew them out and say, hey, backtrack. That's all he does need to do. Just pick the right people and let it run. But I'm going to be respond. I want to be responsive to their question because it's so interesting. Um, and I don't like Rupert Murdoch, right? I don't watch TV, but I'm just, I'm just describing you as management style, which I think is basically the management style of the oligarchs. It's not direct rule; it's indirect. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Do you know my mentor founded CNN? Did you know that? Uh, Reese Schoenfeld and we and uh, Ted Turner did it, and I love Reese. And unfortunately, we just lost his body. He's uh, he's left us uh, last year. So. Um, I want to be responsive to that question because I've got an answer for it. What other examples in history are there? Ravana. What do you think of that? Ravenna. What do you think? Am I uh, right? The Italian. I mean, you mean the Italian Republic on the Adriatic? Yeah. So what I think this is a period in time when the elites have just kind of abandoned Rome and let Alaric sack it. They're like, all right, listen, yeah. sack it. We don't care anymore. Sack the place. Okay. You like I that? Guess, I hadn't thought of it that way. I, I, I need to think that one over a little bit. Um, I was, you know, thinking more in terms of, of the kind of macro life cycle of, of a whole regime, right? The Roman parallels to the American situation are much more apt than anything you can find in the Greek world. Um, and they're much more apt than anything you can find in the medieval world. Uh, if we, when you stretch it to the modern world, it gets a little bit gets a little bit more complicated because there are so few examples of small R Republican government in the 16th, 17th, uh, certainly at scale in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries until the foundation of the United States. Even what, so when you said about the elites leaving New York and I think uh, Janan Glasgow, and let me put her question up here. So uh, about the elites leaving New York and, and kind of the uh, Pelosi's making themselves very distant from their electorate, which is clearly what they've done. They've made a zoom in between, right? There's a zoom tunnel now between her and the electorate I think of Ravenna. I think that the elites, I saw this happening years ago. I think that they've, they are allowing the cities to be sacked. They're going to come back in at a certain point and reclaim them. But for right now, in order for them to, uh, to uh, wipe the marble slate clean, they need to, they need to sack. I guess them. what I still struggle with accepting that is that it's not like they needed to clear enemies out their own enemies out of the cities. The cities were purged of their enemies decades ago. That's not the what they wanted. 
nothing but their core supporters and have been for 50 years. But you're, but you're, I think you're missing what they, what, uh, what's happening. I think what's happening is America as you knew it, as you studied it behind you, doesn't exist anymore. Okay? Yeah, no, I get that. I, I don't, I don't, so founding, I don't deny that. So the founding, you know, so I would, I would be tempted to say parents, the founding fathers, uh, but I, I do want to respect certain changes that I think are fair. So I'll say the founding parents, right, of this new country um, is going to be Mark Zuckerberg. It's going to be Jeff Bezos. And in 20 years, 30 years, history will show, looking back, that America was a failed country, that it collapsed of its own weight, and that uh, the new founders are Zuckerberg, Bezos. And whether you agree with it or not, history is imprinting it right now in that way. So somebody, I think- it's At least it's likely that in 20 years, the indirect rule that I've described is just all the stronger, but the shells of all the institutes. Because if you're Zuckerberg and Bezos and these guys, you have an active interest in keeping the shell of the constitution and the declaration. And Nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. Over. You haven't, you haven't, that's the, the, even if they're just facades, you know, movie sets, you have it. You have an interest in no, keeping all over. appearing to work. No, I say no. Okay. And I say no, because I say no, like if we were there, I'd be pounding the table. Right. And then I would order like an espresso. But so I say no, because, um, I'm not nostalgic. Again, I never read those founding documents, so I see that. I, I, I'm not saying that, by the way. I'm just trying to think like them. If I'm like them, what do I want? I want, I want my wealth. I want my power. You know, I and direct rule is a pain. Direct rule means, to some extent, you're accountable. It means you're subject to people's hatreds. Indirect rules is is, is a genius no, innovation. No. Because so what's happening? I think right, and I don't know. You know so much. You're the you're like uh you're my Strauss, right? So I don't know. I'm just like a noisy kid in the classroom. But so what I think is they know after Hillary's ridiculousness about you know obviously she was never going to go to jail, but just in terms of some type of uh some type of a memorialization of her corruption would have been nice, right? Yeah. But so I think at that point the oligarchs. The megacorps realized that they didn't need to preserve those facades, the judiciary, the legislative. They didn't even need to preserve it because you're, what you're saying is that they were going to preserve these things to give the appearance of continuity, right? A continuity to give yeah. the appearance of continuity. I think they're, they're trying to do that. No, I say it's exactly opposite. The reason they have a green zone is because they don't want continuity. Those days are over. The new, so the way Mark Zuckerberg and these people look at the world, and some of them have like an Asperger's, they're on a scale, right? They have no human empathy whatsoever, very little. I'm not criticizing them. I'm just making an observation of certain yeah, things. So I, I don't think that's the purpose of the green. I mean, to some extent, the purpose of the green zone is to say, we're in charge. It's to cow red America. Like we get to do left wing, you know, left wingers can assemble and take over buildings and do what we want in the streets. This is not an equal opportunity activity. You don't get to do this. So don't ever try it again. I think that's a big part of what the green zone is. I think they, they need, though, I mean, th why do they keep using this now weaponized phrase, our democracy? I've never heard those two words strung together in my, I'm 51. I've heard that phrase more times in the last 12 months than I heard it in the prior 50 years combined, probably 10 times more, right? That's them saying this is a democracy. Like, don't be fooled, people. You may look like an oligarchy. It may look like we've changed everything, but it's all the same. And in fact... <laughs> It's an act of laissez majesty if you even doubt that our democracy is. I, people, the same left-wing academics who all throughout my academic career, as an undergrad in the 80s, as a grad student in the 90s, as somebody writing academic papers and stuff, I, I, all you heard from left-wing academics about the U.S. Constitution was how flawed it was, how out of date it was, how racist it was, compromises with slavery, it's undemocratic, it's this and that, it's the other thing, right? And now these same left-wing academics in 2000, from really Trump's election on, are, are making these obsequious genuflections in front of a document that they, for the prior 30 to 50 years, have dis openly despised. Why is that? Because they want to they want to trick people into believing that they're the true guardians of the Constitution. I, I don't know. I mean, some people must buy it. I don't. But okay. it says to me that they have, they feel that they have a vested interest in pretending that the system still works the way the parchment says it does, and they want the masses of Americans to believe it. Did you ever see the movie Dark City? No. You've got to see it, see the director's cut. Everybody here, see the director's cut because we're living in dark city. While we're quarantined, 
the country is being reassembled, right? And we don't remember the way it used to be. So when you say our democracy, the, the meaning of these things have changed because while we're asleep, they're kind of reassembling what our city looks like. So we don't even have a recollection anymore of what December was like. You can't, of December of 2020, you, there's, or 2019, there's no way that you can have a real um, uh, kind of um, recollection of the way a democracy as we knew it used to be. So I want to go to Janan's, I want to go to Janan. Yeah. Um, okay, because there's so many questions here. So Janan says, and thank you so much for being yeah. here. This is always my least favorite question. <laughs> what is that? It's this your is least my least favorite question. Good. So it's like that. Okay. So Janelle, no, I'm the, you know, a I'm just the analyst. I'm not the programmatic leader guy, and also I'm pretty gloomy. Uh, I guess if I if I were to try to give a positive answer, it would be let me ask let, you a Let's stop focusing on the federal, or or put a lot less resources and attention on the federal. The way forward is community building. Hold on. Is, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Before you answer it, let me say what the question is, because not everybody yeah, okay. has any type of thing. So Janan Glasgow, thank you so much for being here. And um, Janan says, talk about the way forward, the way out of this. And now it's your turn. Yeah. So to me, the way forward and the way out of this, to the extent that there is one, if there is one, uh, is uh, focus on the local, focus on the, the, the community, family, the nearby, what's close to you. Build up your family, build up your friend network, build up local institutions. Um, you know, uh, I, I hate to use buzzwords like this, but like make yourself as anti-fragile as possible and make your communities as anti-fragile as possible. Um, ready to face whatever crisis may be coming. Learn old fashioned outmoded skills that we thought that mechanization, uh, autom uh, 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 automization is about to say, I know that's not a word, uh, automation. <laughs> Uh, all of these things have made passe that people don't, you know, they don't know how to cook. They don't know how to, you know, fix basic things anymore. Learn all of that stuff. To the extent that you're involved in politics, I would, you know, go from the smallest rung and work your way up. Uh, the, the right has always, for a long time, at least during my lifetime, has tended to, I think, focus much too monomaniacally on the presidency. I would go right, the flip side of that, start at uh, city councils, zoning boards, school boards, the littlest things and work your way up to the town level, the city level, the county level, state level, um, build support there if you wanna get involved in politics. Um, the feds is not an avenue, a fruitful avenue for the right right now, as far as I'm concerned, nor will it be for the foreseeable future. But I think there could be a strong role in local communities if, as I expect, the feds are gonna to start to try to do openly tyrannical and unconstitutional things. See, here's the thing, getting tying this to the earlier point, they haven't repealed the constitution. They haven't even repealed any provisions of it. So every time they violate its letter and spirit, they have to come up with a BS rationalization for why this thing is perfectly constitutional. And each rationalization gets dumber and harder to believe than the and more preposterous, more transparently preposterous than the last. The fact that they do it though, tells me that they still feel that they need the legitimacy of this thing. And, they, and they're depending on selling to the people, the notion that they are abiding by it, right? Well, they're going to do anti and unconstitutional things to state and local governments, I predict. And so let's start working now to get those state and local governments as strong as possible to resist it in the name of the constitution and be right and say, you're this, this is illegitimate. This is clearly what this document says, you're violating it and we don't buy your song and dance that this is consistent with the constitution. That's very interesting, Darren uh, Beatty had a similar response where uh, kind of give up on the federal level because there's a, uh, you know, that's a, uh, there's, there's an immediacy to the federal level, but there's also an, uh, it's, there's an, it's unattainable while it's just. Yeah, it's the hardest hill to climb. And even if you win, we won in 2016, what were we able to do in four years? Now I'm not one, you know, Sullivan was after me to say Trump accomplished nothing. The whole thing was a waste. I, I won't go nearly that far. I think he accomplished a lot. He didn't accomplish as, as much as I wanted him to nor did he accomplish as much as needs to be accomplished. But that's because with only the White House, and even his own White House was divided, and then he had really no effective control over the rest of the federal government. And then you have every other power center in the Amer in American society and in the country against him. Being the president, there's not a whole lot one can do. Uh, if you're from our side, if you're from their side, it's a wonderful thing. It's a force multiplier for all the other power centers that you concurrently hold. From our side, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's very limited in what it allows you to do. So the Republican Party 
became, I said this on a chat yesterday, uh, on an event yesterday with a sort of political science event, since I'm a political scientist of sorts, I will repeat it. Um, because the party didn't hold Congress for so long, literally in one unbroken stretch, 40 years from 1954 to 1994, and if you go back further than that, the, the little Republican interregnum, interregnums in the Eisenhower and one two year period in the Truman administration, right? If you go all the way back to the New Deal Congress that sweeps in in 1930, uh, in the, you know, in the middle of Hoover's term, really, it, it was almost 70 years, not unbroken, but 70 years of dominance in, in the House and the Senate a little less, but still pretty dominant. The Republicans, because of that, became essentially a presidential party. The party decided we're not winning at the national or at the legislative level. It's too hard, blah, 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 blah. So we, we put all our eggs in the presidential basket and they get Eisenhower elected twice. Uh, they get uh, Nixon elected twice uh, and then Reagan, Reagan, Bush. And it looked pretty good. Uh, but to be a presidential party now, I think, is, 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 a, is a bad use of the rights resources. It ought to be a state and local party. So we're going to go on because there's a lot of questions. So thank you so much, Janan, for asking that. And uh, we addressed it. Uh, we addressed it kind of directionally. But if, if there's something you'd like to add to it, some more precision, I'd be very interested. Uh, and then there's a lot of interesting questions coming up. So I'm kind of excited about it. Uh, Tamara Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. And I like that picture. So uh, so thank you very much. It's a very, again a very summary kind of happy, pleasant picture. So thank you. Uh, it says were the elites covertly cheering on the destruction in the past, but 2020 was overt. Yeah, I'm, I mean, elites were overt about undermining, you know, morality and the family structure and things like that in the past. Uh, and they they certainly took the lead in loosening up um, criminal law, criminal procedure, uh, in excusing the, there were lots of riots in the 60s, as we know, and into the 70s, and they excused all of that. But I didn't see, you know, I didn't see the cheerleading and the fundraising and you, you, you wouldn't turn on in 1968 or whatever um, uh, uh, one of the networks at NBC and see a commercial where basically some Fortune 50 corporation was saying, we pledge whatever to the people who are burning down Detroit and Watts. Uh, you know, we pledged a, a million dollars. So we're, that didn't happen then. And it happened last year. So I'm going to continue on. Something fundamentally new. I'm going to continue on because Abe Margaret really contributes to that point. And uh, Eve Margaret, thank you so much for being here. You need a picture, Eve says Antifa is being supported by big tech. And I call Antifa the phalanx of big tech. But it really continues on with your point about, uh, you know, corporations kind of merging. With yeah. Yeah, Antifa is a useful street militia for the ruling class because, anti I mean, it's it, this, look, this is also a, a kind of a tough one because I think Antifa are, you know, some of these people are, they're dangerous and they're crazy. And to the extent that the elites say, well, you're kind of on our side and we know you hate the right, but you know, do you think, you think of an Antifa mob? Um, I mean, they did, they, they smashed the windows at Apple stores and stuff. They're, they're burning down left-wing citadels. They're burning down Portland and Seattle, right? Are there a lot, I mean, how many Trumpists or, um, you know, uh, icons of red America are in Portland or Seattle? So Antifa is a kind of, I think a, a, a dangerous out of control kind of <laughs> rabid animal that, uh, tech and the left, I think, hopes or wishes they could control, but I, I wonder if they really can. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of questions here, and I want, I see something that I want to be responsive to because it's so interesting, which is this one, right? Orville 999, does Adam read Super Chats? I don't really. It's easiest to communicate with me just via the comments because this for me is a hobby, right? I want to give back, and uh, Periscope is a place that's still an asylum from all the algorithms, so I think it's pretty cool that there's a kind of a, a freedom here. I don't feel like I'm going to be stormtrooped in any way. Uh, and I see the comments that are coming in from YouTube and the comments that are coming in from Periscope. And I'm just trying to go down them. And I know there's so many. And uh, I promise you, we're going to rip through them kind of fast now. Um, so um, noodles for you. Oh, good to see you again. Says there's no feeling of security. They won't allow riots again. Interesting point because uh, a friend of mine is uh, – from Sudan, no, Somalia, they're from Somalia. Um, wherever that Congresswoman is from, he's from the same place, Somalia, Sudan. And he says, you know, he talks about political Islam, you know, he, they've got their own problems over there. And he said, what they do in these countries, uh, and he's very observant, he's just a wonderful human being. He says, what they do is they have you afraid to leave your house. 
And if you don't have the feeling of security to leave your house, nothing else matters. Yeah. Um, I think that if, if I understand the, the ruling class mind accurately, uh, I think they think the riots have served their purpose and they would like to, they don't want to see them start up again. They don't need them right now. There's no Trump, they're in control. The riots would make them look bad. It would put them in a difficult position. Um, either they crack down and they really uh, alienate a huge portion of their base, or they don't crack down and they they show like rioting in 2020 was almost like no politically it was hard to see them lose. Actually, this is a good point. This is a good. There was a, a strain of public opinion in 2020 that said, "Oh, Trump's going to be reelected because one thing we know." Rioting always favors the Republicans as the law and order party, right? Well, that didn't happen. Um, uh, but in one sense, rioting, you know, the, the damage to the Democrats was limited because Trump was the president. And so if Trump cracks down, they can call him a fascist. And if he doesn't crack down, they can call him ineffective and incapable of, of, of keeping order, right? Well, we don't really lose either way. Uh, and they were, because they have the media 100% on their side, they had no real problem with just papering over the fact that it was basically 100% Democratic governors, Democratic mayors, Democratic district attorneys, Democratic, uh, you know, police chiefs and so on that were allowing all this stuff to happen. So I think if I were them, my take on it would be, we don't want this to happen again. We're not going to egg it on in that case. Um, we, if it were to start, they're going to be in a bind, right? Do they crack down? And, so now, and we're going to go on to some other questions, but do you feel... And I'll give you my prediction. Do you think there's going to be more riots? And do you think it's going to be as instrumentalized as we saw? I mean, there, there needs to be a trigger. And these things don't just happen. They, 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 there always has to be some kind of event or thing that the, pe the people who want to egg it on ha can seize on. So let's the Derek Chauvin trial is happening right now. Let's say, which I don't for a second expect, he's somehow acquitted. That'll very likely be seized. Is that, the guy, is that the guy that was like... On the That's guys. a cop in Minneapolis who and he was, was on the person's neck, right? He was on. Was that the person who had their knee on their yeah. neck? Because I follow this. Yes. Although it's not established that that was the cause. In fact, the police and the medical examiner and the state attorney general are being very cagey about what the cause of death was, which suggests well, that it wasn't what they say it is. I'm I'm going to say that there. I think there's going to be riots, and I think that there's going to be antifa type of riots because the biggest problem. And I have friends throughout throughout the world who have been very helpful, kind of informing on me because they're all in government says that in you know in certain countries antifa has become kind of legitimized by the government even their violence has become very legitimized particularly in western europe by yeah. the government. and i think antifa is going to be used to beat up people who are protesting about 100 percent tax rates and kind of oppressive carbon taxes that so, i could that i absolutely could see i'm just wondering if the extent to which people on the right will actually go out and protest that is to me, one of the lessons of the harsh, harsh crackdown post January 6th and the green zone, as you call it, is that's a message from the state, the regime saying right wing protest is illegitimate. Don't do this. We will come after you. Right? We will do nothing about people who burn the downtowns of major American cities. But if you so much as carry a sign saying, you know, you know down with taxes or whatever, uh, we'll, we'll make sure we get you. In, uh, in Germany, people who were protesting taxes in 2019 and the farmers, there was a lot going on. There was a lot of dissent about uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership and then particularly about certain uh, gas taxes that were coming out that uh, they called them white supremacists also. These were people that were driving their tractors and they said, if you're complaining about it, you're a white supremacist. And um, that, it, you know, I expect the same thing here. And I expect Antifa to be used as a wedge because that... Uh, Calling people a racist and then beating them up is such an effective strategy, unfortunately. So there's another question. Oh, I missed it. No, there's this one. You're a um, Jack Griffin, 1701. It's a nice picture. If that's really your picture, it's a really nice picture, right? So um, says Reagan, fascism will come from the left. Boy, was he right. Yeah, nothing to add. <laughs> um, and uh, so Sherlock Cox 7, thank you for, so much for joining us. And it looks like a makeup brush, right? Based on everything oh, I told you. It's a shuttlecock. It's a badminton birdie. You know. Oh, is that what it is? Oh, that's yeah. so cool. Because you have glasses. I don't have glasses. I can't see that. Uh, so shuttlecock seven says, based on everything Anton knows about history, what does it take to make democracy work? Well, uh, first of all, I would say, <laughs> um, you know, democracy purely understood doesn't really work all that well, right? Democracy has to be moderated. It has to be mediated. It has to be mixed. There has to be 
un or less democratic elements of a stable regime, which is why the founders have a presidency, why they have a why they have a bicameral legislature, why they have an independent judiciary elected uh, appointed for life. All of these things are meant to be checks on democracy. Um, uh, ideas taken in part from Aristotle's idea of the mixed regime that any simple regime, whether it's the rule of the one, the few, or the many, is always bad. Simple regimes are always all of them always bad. So. If, if I may reframe the question to say, what does it take to make small r republicanism work? Um, it requires a lot of things. It requires a, a virtuous citizenry that's fit for it. And even when you have that, it's, I think, too much to ask for to hope that that it'll last forever. And nothing, no regime lasts forever. They're all going to go away. They're all going to rot. They're all going to decay and give way to something else or collapse or something. Um, so the question is, how long can you make it go? Uh, and... Yeah, and I'm of two minds about this. America has been a republic now for um, nearly 250 years, and you could say, "Oh God, that you know, is that a long time or a short time?" Well, the the best regimes of the ancient world uh, that chugged along in a republican form got about uh, 500 years out. So we're halfway there. We're not going to make it to 500. At least I don't I don't see it. Um, but in the in the modern circumstance, and with all the ways things are different now than they were in, in the ancient world, is uh, 250 years, pretty good. Maybe it is, um, but we can't expect we can't expect this uh, to last forever. And in fact, maybe you know we have to ask ourselves: uh, those who get to rebuild, whenever the rebuilding happens, should ask themselves the question: What are we trying to do here? And if you set yourself the goal a perpetual regime that is that will never fall, you're setting yourself up for something impossible. And Jay Berg uh, says, in whatever character that is, right? Says, That's true, yeah. Jesse Kelly, and you mentioned something about this before, so if you can help, because it's getting into my head. Jesse Kelly says we are in Rome pre-Caesar. Maybe. Uh, um, but as I said earlier, we might be past that point, but instead of Caesar being one person, Caesar is sort of a combination of a committee and a hive mind. And I'm, I'm the more I think about it, the more I start to incline to the latter view. Right. So, Joe Biden is clearly not Caesar. If you read Plutarch's Life of Caesar or Suetonius or Caesar's own works or anything about Caesar, like this is a person of of, of talent and capability that is rare in human history. Um, not, not merely is he that much greater than Joe Biden. I mean, he's that much greater than almost anyone who ever lived. And he really did rule. Right. Once Caesar was uh, elected, you know, first he's elected dictator for 10 years and then he's elected dictator, not elected, but made Senate by the Senate dictator for life. I mean, he's really exercising power in a way that obviously Joe Biden isn't, right? What what exercises power in America today? You have to ask yourself that question. And it's a weird combination of power centers that some rule directly, most of them rule indirectly, and that act as a hive mind, that all agree. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, there's no committee. There is no Illuminati. There's no conference room where the people really in charge get together and make the decisions because they don't need to. Okay, the people so make decisions all agree with one another. You mentioned Trump before, and I just had a periscope with Robert Barnes, and we were discussing kind of the allocation of resources that Trump had, legal resources uh, versus, do you remember the uh, tr um, the uh, election integrity project? Do you remember, do you know what that was? The transition integrity. Yes, I got a death threat based on my criticism okay. of it. Well, but it's very interesting. Big, uh, and I'm not going to mention kind of the resource allocation. I mean, just because I'd like to spread it around as widely as possible. The person who threatened my life and said that I ought to be shot was Nils Gilman, N-I-L-S-G-I-L-M-A-N of the Bergruen Institute and also of the University of California. Nils Gilman, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to hang that little ignominious episode around his neck forever. Did it on Twitter, which of course Twitter not only didn't censor, didn't even rebuke in any way, nor did his employer. This is what we are living in now. The left can openly call for the death of its enemies and nothing happens if a conservative so much as jaywalked their life is over oh I sorry <laughs> no oh, that was an that was an awesome point so i'm just going to keep going on from that a neo nation state like the picture um says it seems to me that cities have become unprofitable coerced transition to smaller smart cities and is that part of what you see as kind of this uh renewal yeah, I, I don't see a future for the cities over the next 20 or 30 years i mean what's going to happen in these places uh, my friends in in new york uh, say that the Midtown office buildings have, uh, have been effectively empty now for 12 months, right? So think about that. Think about all the office space and the capital sunk into these gigantic building, buildings, some of which are worth more than a billion dollars, uh, and all the subsidiary businesses that support them. Um, 
why would you live in Manhattan, right? I mean, I guess you do. So I'm, I'm sorry for rubbing it in, but like, why, why live in Manhattan when you don't, your job doesn't require you to be there anymore. The restaurants are closed. The theaters are closed. The museums are closed. The streets are, are deserted and there's crime and grime everywhere. The mayor's a psychopath. The governor's a psychopath. And your next mayor is probably going to be just as big a fool and have no idea how to get the city back. The purpose of the city as it has existed of any American city, as it has existed for the course of American history has, was uh, fund, if not wiped out, just fundamentally degraded in 2020. And it's, it's going to be a generation to get it back if it ever comes back. Oh, thank you for that. And truth, justice, and liberty. You know who that picture is? That is Jeb Clampett, Jed Clampett of, uh, of uh, the Beverly Hillbillies of 1960s, played by Buddy Epson. Yeah, and that's right. And who played Jethro? Uh, Max Baer. Max Baer Jr. Ma okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you got me. Yeah, yeah. That was Max Baer, the boxer's son. Oh, okay. That's right. That's right. Hold on. Nancy's got some trivia. What, Nancy? The movie that Sean Cruz sang it. Yeah. The song was Free Falling. Yeah. It was uh, Jerry Maguire. No, no, wait, no. He sings in another movie. Nancy's giving me some trivia that's wrong. It's not horrible. So, um, so Truth, Justice, and Liberty. Thank you so much for that and for the nostalgia, right? That was pretty cool. It says, they hate God. Christians are the ultimate target. They're definitely, I... I'm not a very devotional person, but, you know, I, I do try and practice very regularly and so does my wife. And uh, they're really, you know, we miss a lot of that. I'm sure you do as well. And a lot of people do. You kind of miss that engagement with other people that can only happen in a, a place of devotion where everybody is there in appreciation. Right. So uh, Truth, Justice, Liberty says they hate God. Christians are the ultimate target. Well, sort of. I mean, if you if you're in a blue area, any mainstream, uh, any um, mainline Protestant church will have all the requisite BLM, you know, the, the rainbow flag, all of the signage that you're supposed to have to to demonstrate maximum wokeness. So they don't hate those Christians. Right. They hate red Christians. They hate, you know, evangelical Christians. They hate fundamentalist Christians. They hate devout uh, Catholics. Um, who are anti-abortion and respect and believe in the church's teachings on other things. That, that's what they hate. They don't hate, you know, they don't hate woke spiritual uh, Christians. They hate traditional Christians. Um, Sherlock Hawk has a question that I didn't get a chance to see yet, but question for, uh, for Anton. And first I saw Q, so I got it, my heart got a little bit crazy. Um, no, I, Q, no, 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 not me. I know, I know so... Uh, at first I saw Q and I'm like, oh no. But then Sherlock Cox 7 says, uh, question for Anton, is communist ideology going to be with us forever or will it die someday? So do you see it kind of becoming vaporous? Yeah, I do. I don't think, I, I think, you know, I, doctrines that have lasted thousands of years, the only, you know, I can only think of, uh, that are not religious, philosophic or programmatic doctrines, certain doctrines of the ancient philosophers but which were very had very niche appeal throughout the centuries and were not so programmatic i don't think communism is like that i don't think you see it being around for a millennium um the, but the underlying problem that gives rise to communism is a sort of fundamental dynamic in human society and that's not going to go away so there's always going to be there's always going to be a divide anytime people get together to have a political community and rule there will be some kind of divide uh does it have to be this big and this bitter, I don't think it does. But I also think maybe one of the things that we've demonstrated is, you know, you can't have a country this large and this diverse and, and keep it unified for a long term. You know, maybe maybe the old, we go back to the founders original argument. One of their original arguments was, can we make this work in a country that's this big? And that was when America was only 3 million people. What if you sat Hamilton, you know, Hamilton, Jay and Madison are all making this argument in the Federalist Papers. They have to tell Americans, no, it's okay. We can do, we can make a republic that's this large with, you know, 3 million people in the extent of territory that we have. If you said to them, well, now it's the whole continent and it's 330 million. I wonder if they would say, yeah, that's too big even for us. I don't know. Yeah. And I'm not against, you know, I told Paul Gottfried I wanted a monarchy. He said, no, you don't, you want uh, an authoritarian, right? He said their, their uh, monarchy stuck. And he said, authoritarians, at least you can negotiate with them. And there's a kind of a better, there's a gooder type of cruelty to them. So um, there's, there's a comment here. I'm sorry, did I cut you off? No, I'm here. Okay, so Rel Mark, thank you so much for joining us, and um, says Trump won because Hillary ran a lazy campaign and he ran a great one. I mean, 
I, yeah, sure. I, I, I still, I, I try not to read too much into 2016 for the simple reason that I forgot what the popular vote differential was, but it was like three and a half million votes, wasn't it? And it's something like five million votes or six million. I, you know, but the vote counting takes so long that you have to check in like 30 to 60 days after an election now to actually find out what the final tally was. But at any rate, 2016 came down to around, is a, the number that I have in my head is correct, 77,000 votes, not merely in three states, but in five counties in three states. So it's hard to draw any uh, really conclusive lessons from something so narrow and fluky, I think. And you could even say the same more so about 2020, because I think 2020 came down to 30 or 40,000 votes, an even fewer number of votes, but spread across like five states. So depending on how you, you know, you count it up, like there's ways that if certain states had flipped, you get to 269, 269, and it goes to the House. If you take, you know, these three states, if you take these three states, then Trump, you know, it's 271. And I forgot. I had worked it all out before when I was writing a piece and you know, I, didn't, I didn't memorize it. But both of these elections in the sense of the Electoral College were, were, were pretty fluky and very, very narrow. So what we do know is that I think it's pretty clear that um, – the blues have a straight up popular vote majority that seems to me to be insurmountable for the Republicans. I just, unless there's some kind of vast realignment, I don't, I don't see it happening. Um, which is why the, the left, the Democrats would love to get rid of the electoral college because they know they'd never lose again. And which is why I think it's foolish when I hear Trump or Trumpists talk about getting rid of the electoral college, it would mean that we could never win again. Not that I think we're going to win again anyway. So I want to, uh, so Rising Serpent, thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you so much for also participating in the investor series, because which is so important to me. A lot of people on the chat are talking within, with, uh, to each other about um, 100% taxes. And I think a lot of people here get it that if you're going to have a negative interest rate, and I'll put their, if you're going to have a negative savings rate, and I'll put their, their comments on as I, I kind of find them. But so Rising Serpent says, how and why did Trump end up hiring so many people who opposed his agenda? Yeah, that's a great question. I wish I had a very clear answer for it. I can give you some speculation and, and some of what I saw up close. So some of it was just there was um, a any incoming administration of either party depends on this bench of people that have worked in prior administrations. And when you run against your own party to the extent Trump did and you have all these people signing letters saying I will never work for the guy and, and you, you know, you ran on a totally contrary agenda, your bench is obviously much smaller. There wasn't this cadre of Trumpists waiting to come in. Um, to some extent, you know, he did, in a, we can, um, we can debate this another time, but Machiavelli gives advice in chapter 22 of the prince. He advises the prince who takes power to make use of suspect men. He says, people who had opposed you before, hire them, by which he means hire me <laughs> to the, to, to Lorenzo de' Medici, right? Well, you know, you could say, I don't know that Trump explicitly took Machiavelli's advice. That is to say, he read it in the book and decided to follow it, but he did that. He hired, but he thought like, okay, I won, it's over. I'll hire a bunch of people who would oppose me and they'll be loyal and it'll all work out. And it didn't work out. And then I think he took a lot of bad advice from people inside saying, no, no bring in this guy and he'll be okay. And he'll be okay. And Trump thought, yeah, you know, all right. Um, and, you know, it, we have to lay that at his feet in the final analysis, unfortunately. He was the boss. These decisions were his. And he hired a lot of people he shouldn't have hired. He didn't hire many people that he should have hired. And he fired a lot of people that he shouldn't have fired. And at the end of the day, everybody always you know, wants to make an excuse for the boss. And I kind of understand that. But at the end of the day, he was in charge. And we have to say, you know, you could have should have done better on, on the personnel side, Mr. President. Yeah, I and I did that Periscope with Amanda. I did one with, I did two with Darren. And I, I did the one with Robert Barnes recently, and uh, there's a common denominator, not just that they're all awesome people, but that uh, their reflections on the hiring. And Amanda said, you have to start all the way at the top. And yeah. she, was, she didn't want to start at the Trump level. She kind of went one level below him. I think she said uh, it began, she, she first noticed things were going awry with Rance Priebus. Yeah. Now... Admittedly, this shows my naivete, I suppose. I thought at the time, what a great idea. So you have Bannon over here giving the kind of intellectual energy and the populist momentum. And then you have Reince with his Hill connections and his DC insiderness wor working the levers to smooth it and make sure the agenda gets passed. And in fact, Reince, I don't think, was a problem in the sense that he was blocking Trump's agenda because pretty early on, Reince and Bannon synced up and, and allied with one another. 
Uh, uh, the bigger problem with getting the agenda passed early on wasn't even so much the personnel, although that was an issue. It was that Trump just decided not to run against Congress anymore. He ran against the Republican establishment and he got in there and in the same way I think he hired people he shouldn't have hired in administration, he decided that, you know, he was just going to go and shake hands and make a deal bygones with uh, McConnell and Paul Ryan. And instead, they just ran circles around him and double crossed him over and over again and forced him to do what they wanted him to do and not what he ran on. So they didn't want to give him immigration and they didn't want to give him infrastructure and they didn't want to give him the things that he wanted to do. They wanted him to do tax cuts and deregulation and Obamacare and that kind of thing. And uh, he went all in on that which I think was, in hindsight, a mistake. His, uh, Nav I know Navarro. And yeah. uh, um, Navarro first came in on the infrastructure because I was a part of that. You know, in terms of public policy financing of infrastructure, I was going to be part of the financing side, on the private financing side. And uh, I saw front row um, the infrastructure that uh, Trump had hoped for, which was actually very significant, Hopefully, maybe we'll see some type of an infrastructure with the Great Reset, whatever they call it, where we can see some real uh, infrastructure building. Nevertheless, um, Trump's plan, I think, was a lot better, actually, because it was uh, uh, pragmatic. Nevertheless, it was I saw McConnell and uh, and his wife, who was uh, the um, transportation one or late or transportation, right? Prime Minister of Transportation, yeah. um, which is the position that. Uh, Buttigieg, however his name said, yeah. I, and they said, well, it's not a glamorous position. That is like a fifth of that position. There is so much money that goes through that, and they really sabotaged, sabotaged Trump on that, just from what I observed with Navarro. So then when, when, when Navarro went over to trade, he was the one who did that, in, uh, implemented that 301 review of China, and, you know, whatever. Yep. We got another question. So Election Wizard, oh, thank you so much for joining us. Do you know uh, Election Wizard at all? No. Election Wizard, I was actually just on their site today because I was watching a little bit of the uh, the jury selection stuff for um, for George Floyd. So I was watching that for a few minutes today. So they're on Twitter. So if ever you decide to kind of go back there or if you decide to go there, it's Wizard Predicts. And they've got an awesome website. And the, uh, the website is uh, electionwiz.com. And uh, I have no interest in it other than to say – Robert Barnes has agreed to write for them. Amanda Milius has agreed to write for them. And uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll write something awesome and maybe about Machiavelli in context also for their uh, for their website because their website is like a capsule of all the news from a very conservative slant. So definitely do consider writing something for them. So Election Wizard, thank you so much for joining us. It says, many believe America's great check on tyranny is a well-armed citizenry. Do you agree? Well, that, that is a dangerous question to ask and an even more dangerous question to answer. So I will answer it in the following way, uh, like an academic. Um, the Declaration of Independence is quite specific and refers it to different places, to the fundamental right of revolution as a natural right, a right of nature that inheres in mankind because of its status as a free thinking human being uh, with, with natural rights, right? And the United States government is itself founded in armed revolution against a a king, against a legitimate king, which they uh, charge in the 18 charges at the back of the declaration is whom they charge of, of um, using his power despotically or tyrannically, which justifies this armed revolution. So that right can never be taken away. It's a right of nature. It is a right, however, that no government specifically uh, ever honors. In fact, all governments consider, all existing governments consider what a revolution against itself to be insurrection um to be unjust so if you know you'll you've heard the old saying if you're going to strike at the king you can't miss right the question of exercising this right which is natural and which inheres in human nature is always a matter of prudence is the is the tyranny under which you're you know what is the, the declaration also very specifically says men are inclined to suffer evils so long as evils are sufferable right in other words we're human beings by nature will put up with a lot rather than go through the toil and trouble of overthrowing ruling arrangements to which they've been long accustomed and taking all of those risks. So it's a, really a twofold prudential question. One is, are things bad enough to justify this now? Because the, the revolution itself is going to be is going to be bad and difficult. And then the second point is, can you pull it off? Because if you try it and you fail, the government isn't going to say, well, all's fair. 
you know, no harm, no foul. You were just exercising your natural right. That's cool. Um, now that you lost, we'll back off. The government's going to say that was not a, a, a legitimate exercise of a legitimate natural right. That was insurrection. In um, that was, um, you know, what, what you know. Think about all the terms that people are applying to January sixth right now. Um, sedition. There and they're going to they're going to use the power of the state to completely crush you, right? So the exercise of that fundamental natural right is always subject to prudence. Prudence is subject to caution. Um, caution, you know, I guess can be dismissed at, or denigrated as, um, to borrow another Machiavellian term, pusillanimity, right? Well, you just got, you, you never want to do anything, you know, what, you know, um, okay. But, you know, if you charge in a machine gun nest that's well fortified and you don't really have a chance of taking it and you get killed, you can call that heroic. But one, you know, from another perspective, you could also call it imprudent. So I would caution people against thinking, or I would just caution people when they think along these lines, think it through in all the particulars. Uh, I lost, I can't hear you. I might have. No, I put it on mute, you know what? Oh, okay. I was thinking, did I, kick my, did I kick the cord and I unplugged myself somehow? My cats were squabbling. Okay. And I've got a really big cat, it's a Maine Coon, and then I've got like a little petite cat named Annie, and the Maine Coon, pounces like a leopard on uh but they they love each other but pounces it's like uh what was that show like national geographic what was that show the wild something i grew up mutual of omaha's wild kingdom with marlon perkins when i was a kid that was a big thing that was it that's what i was trying to say it was exactly like that it's that's like watching my cats it's like the wild kingdom it's like wow okay so um so uh, Donna Fazio, thank you so much for being here. You got to get a picture. And thank you for joining us from YouTube. And I see a lot of people here are from YouTube. And uh, I use YouTube kind of as an alternative almost. But the thing that I like about uh, Periscope right now is that uh, it's like an asylum from the algorithms. And, uh, and it's also from the asylum from uh, not just the Twitter algorithms and the social media algorithms, but people are becoming human algorithms, which is... Uh, you know, which is actually even more frightening that people have, they, pe everyone's becoming that 11 year old girl who uh, slays everybody in her family and then goes next door and slays them too. So Don Fazio says, if SCOTUS won't take on controversial constitutional disputes, the left won't need to rewrite the constitution. It will just be slowly uh, changed through failure to protect it by those charged with that task. Yeah, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's already happened. So I, you know, that's not an if or a maybe or a win or a looking forward. That's that's a present reality. Um, I put no stock in the court at all. Uh, as far as I can tell, there are only two good justices on the court. And that's Thomas and Alito. Uh, to the rest of it, the court is part of the regime. It exists to ratify what the regime wants ratified and to come up with rationalizations for why this is constitutional. It, it does nothing for us. Uh, for anybody who is a conservative, right of center, a Trumpist, or anybody loyal to the actual constitution as written and as it is supposed to operate, the Supreme Court is not your friend or ally. It is on the okay. other side. So, and Donna Fazio, we're, I'm gonna ask part two of your questions, like a follow-up, right? Um, like I'm in, the, I'm in the White House press corps and I'm wearing a mask and I'm gonna ask the follow-up. So, but you have so much kind of, a, you know, a historical framework. Uh, so did you, you know, this is like an age old question. I had the same conversation with Will Chamberlain, who's awesome, right? And, um, you know, did you expect there to be a justice in terms of reviewing of these cases of, uh, of the Trump lawsuits? I mean, you know what justice is. Your whole kind of academic career has been, you know, kind well, which of, lawsuits do you mean? Um, well, Robert Barnes, for example, presented one. Uh, or, on the election stuff? Yeah, the election stuff. And then, no. like, the was no, they won't allow any of that to stand. No, not a chance. But no, my question was, did you expect it? Do you expect the courts to uh, be, to do, did you expect the Supreme Courts to do kind of the right thing? Or did you expect no. them to not? Did you no. know that was going to happen? I'm just making a prediction, which may turn out to be false. But I think, I think the preponderance of evidence, if past, uh, if past performance is any guide, I will expect, I mean, the Supreme Court, Look at what they did during the election. They had two huge cases come up before. Well, and they had one come up before uh, and say, no, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm getting this wrong. When the Texas AG sued over uh, basically a 14th Amendment, an equal uh, protection or due process lawsuit and was joined by four or five other states. And they sued to say, look, these other states are not meeting their obligations 
um, under federal law to certify that the votes are real. The Supreme Court declined to hear it, seven to two. And then I forgot the second case that came up. And again, they declined to hear it. So there's no chance. And that was the first their argument was, well, you don't have standing to do this before the election. Right. There were some other cases that they wouldn't hear. And then it was um, we don't have time because the thing is going to get ratified or that, you know, we have to get this over with by January. And afterward, well, it's moot now. We don't need to look into it. So now that it's well behind them and over, there's absolutely no chance they're going to do anything on this. OK, but did you expect in advance before these things happen? Uh, the Texas lawsuit, which I think Will Chamberlain, because I really relied on him for his kind of critique of these things, uh, thought that it was a somewhat flawed suit. I don't recall all of his explanation for it. But in it, and then there was the Georgia suits, and then there was the Philadelphia ones where Scalia said, you know, you've got to hold on to this paperwork, whatever it was. It before those things happened, right? As they were kind of emerging, those lawsuits. Did you expect the um, the the court system, the SCOTUS court system to to work, or did you expect justice to not work? I expected it not to work. I haven't I haven't had any faith in the Supreme Court in a long time. I expected it. Sorry, not to work. Yeah, just to tell, you, tell you you asked. So it's sad. Yeah, it's sad. It's, it's it, I had to take it in for a second. Rising Serpent asked another interesting question, which I'm very interested. I asked Ryan, the uh, Ryan, a friend of yours. Um, from, um, uh, from Claremont, and I, I still didn't forget that they didn't publish your article, right? We'll talk about that one day. So Rising Serpent... I mean, that was five years ago, so for what it's worth. Yeah. So Rising Serpent, and again, thank you for joining us, I'm very interested in this, says Democrats have been very effective at the cultural message that conservatism equals yeah. racism. Why are conservatives still using that term? Because it's been, it's been taken away from them. Can they recapture it? Can we capture which term? Conservatism? Conservative. Okay, so first is the term itself, right? The power of language. Yeah. That uh, the the left has taken taken away its meaning, right? And they've reintroduced its meaning to mean racism. So why should somebody call themselves a conservative? And how can they win that cultural messaging? Back? That's a good point. But I would also add the following to it, which is that conservatives themselves have degraded the meaning of the term conservative, where conservatism, it just came to mean tax cuts and deregulation and, you know, Wall Street and this kind of thing. And it, it doesn't connect with, you know, like I said, I'm a fairly blue person. My life has revolved around the coasts, but I know now more people from the interior than I've ever known in my life. And they all, and they're very pro-Trump and so on. And they all tell me like the, the very word conservatives, conservatism doesn't resonate with us, doesn't resonate out here anymore. You know, it just, people don't care. People in like, you know, Peoria or South Dakota or Louisiana, Arkansas, the Texas panhandle, this idea of like the conservatism that got the Beltway geeks excited in the 80s and 90s, you know, they just it doesn't connect at all with ordinary people as life has lived on the ground in red america so i'd be absolutely fine with ditching the term and in fact ditching a lot of the substance if conservatism just means the the reagan agenda forever you know if you can redefine conservatism to mean the trump agenda okay but you know why, why use the same label especially if it's tainted from both directions if it's tainted from a kind of outmoded, you know, Paul Ryan, Jack Kempism that's disconnected from people's ordinary lives. And then the left says it's completely racist, you know, yeah, fine. I'm, I'd be happy to, you know, hand conservative, the word phrase conservatism over to AEI, the Heritage Foundation and National Review and let them have it. I, I just don't care anymore. Yeah, really interesting points. I was actually thinking about my meetings with Paul Ryan. Uh, I had one with Mitt Romney. And uh, they're stupid. Did you know that? They're just really, and I was so right. I had one meeting with Mitt Romney for like 90 minutes once, um, quite a while ago. I was surprised. Did, so probably around 2009, 2010. And uh, I was actually really impressed by him. I thought he was very smart. Uh, you know, I, I've obviously been extremely dismayed by his behavior <laughs> in the last four or five years. Um, but that's the way he came off to me at the time. I wasn't impressed with him, with him or Paul Ryan at all, because they were discussing industries that I'm actually a specialist in, or I was a specialist at that time, with uh, Mitt Romney's kind of version of Obamacare that happened in Massachusetts, um, and I could discuss that. And then uh, Paul Ryan, who wanted to be known as a policy wank, who uh, policy wank, who was well, he is a policy wank too. That was a, that was a Freudian slip, but it might actually be more accurate than what you said. I know, I know. I was just. Really, I, 
if you have a good Twitter, pro, you gotta you, here's you, you like to coin terms, right? You coined this one, so I should say you should you should own it. Policy wank. Come on now, you gotta okay. admit it's good. But then it might work, and then I'm gonna get like ten thousand like letters in academia saying, "Can we use policy wank?" You uh, should say absolutely, as long as you apply it to the right people. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Lex, you see, thank you so much for joining us, and I like the picture of the arm. And um, it says the revealing effect of Trump. I want to respond to this at first, actually. Also, the revealing effect of Trump was the most important thing he did. Sun Tzu, know your enemy. I did, and thank you for that, Lex. You see, I did a periscope with uh, John Robb, who's awesome. And uh, John Robb was asked a question about kind of the, the Trump administration, its success, and how he would kind of measure it. I forget the exact phraseology for it, but he said Trump was um, given the presidency to be a disruptor, right? They want, people wanted to see a disruptor. And in that way, uh, he gave people exactly what they want because he really did disrupt. So yeah. he, met, yeah. he forced the regime out of its shell in a way or out of its, um, it, made, it made it hard to deny what the regime is and how they operate and who they are and what they want. The four, the four year meltdown, five year meltdown tantrum that they've been having. Like if Hillary had just won, we would have slid into blue managerial despotism in a much easier way, kind of almost without noticing, you know? Um, that's the best way for these kinds of things to happen. It reminds me actually of an old, <laughs> of an old Simpsons joke where it's set way in the future and Marge is watching TV late at night and it's like 20 years from, you know, from forward in the time frame, And she just, you hear this sort of, wow, you know, cheesy music. And she says, Fox became a hardcore porn channel so gradually I hardly even noticed, right? That's the best way to do it. It's like you wake up one day and you look back and you go, oh my God, it really is a tyranny. And you can't point to any particular step when it happened. That if Hillary had won, it would have been more like that. It would the it would have been much easier to maintain the veneer of continuity. The 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 Russia hoax, all the BS thrown at Trump, this just insane screeching, did rip the mask off of what the regime really is and what its people really want to a degree that woke up Red America a lot more than they were already awake. It, I don't think it was enough for you know to turn the ship around or for Red America to regain its rightful place as sort of half the nation with interests and uh, that have to be reckoned with and compromised with. But it made the governing the task of Blue America's governing a lot harder, and it's one of the reasons why Blue the, the Blue regime is is a much more coercive, openly coercive now than I think it would have been had we been be, been beginning Hillary's second term right now. It would have been able to be a lot softer and more uh, more covert about the way it exercises power, more indirect, to, to borrow a phrase from earlier. Do you know, I was reading again, um, Discourse on Libby Today, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and there's so much in my head, but I'm afraid of saying it because then you're going to correct me. But essentially, <laughs> he said that uh, our you know po political systems can deteriorate kind of imperceptibly, right? Um, and uh, I guess that's where we that's where we are. It is imperceptible, and it's part of that dark city effect that we're seeing everything kind of degrade to uh, a mob. Yeah, world. I think it's quite perceptible now. It was much more. I mean, it, it was clear to me before all of this, um, but now it's clear to what he does say. I think I think what you're you're pointing to is there's a phrase he uses almost the same language in. Um, the discourses that he uses in chapter three of the prince where he says that uh you know certain diseases of the he makes an analogy to diseases of the body are only recognizable to someone prudent but you can't get other people to believe it because the symptoms are so few right and then it gets to a point where the disease is overwhelming and the body is almost dead where everybody can see the problem but it's past curing um so the i the the idea for the statesman is the statesman has to be able to see these things early Right and 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 check them before they become rampant. The problem is very few are going to listen because they're going to say, "I don't see it." And I have other things to do. Right? Why are we worried about this right now when this isn't even a thing? Well, by the time you notice it's a thing, you're going to be dead or 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 near death. So that's why we have to worry about it now. So the plan with Obamacare um, was that, and again, I you know I um, I let people I use Twitter to kind of help curate my reality. Right? I think that's what Twitter is really good for because reality is so complex and intricate and so fragmented that uh, I rely on a lot of people to uh, to curate my reality. And um, 
And because it, you, I'm very careful with what I let into my head, which is why I keep on reading, rereading the classics so much because I'm afraid to let too much stuff intrude into my mind. And uh, I, I recall, oh, uh, actually, I see some some really interesting questions here. So I'm I'm going to forget everything I just said, and I'm going to go to them. But I recall that they did uh, kind of post mortems on Obamacare, and one of the points was that. Um, and I know about this, I'm a specialist in this as well, so I just thought that they were right about it, was that they were correct about it, their assessment of it, was that the governors knew that once it failed, which it did fail, uh, they would no longer be in office, so it didn't matter to them. They were just going to be someplace else. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, a classical tyrant has the problem that he can't let go, he, you know, he has the wolf by the ears and he can't let go. You know, uh, we were talking about Thucydides earlier. In Pericles, Par Par there's three speeches of Pericles in Thucydides. And in the final one, he says to an Athenian public that's getting tired of running the Athenian Empire, the Delian League, he says, uh, you know, this thing that we have, our empire, is sort of like a tyranny. Uh, perhaps unjust to have taken, but dangerous to let go, right? Once you're the tyrant, it's hard to resign and not get killed. I can think of a couple of examples. One off the top of my head, one from the ancient world. Sulla became dictator for life and did retire and go to Capri and lived out the rest of his life. In our time, Pinochet became tyrant of Chile in 1973 and, and retired, resigned in 1988, and then was, did get uh, her, um, hounded by, uh, by European courts, in particular the Spanish courts. So it's, it's a hard thing to let go uh, if you really are uh, in charge. That's another great reason for indirect government, right? No one can, no one, you know, you and I may look at Jeff Bezos and think you're sort of kind of in the power you yield in your unaccountability akin to an ancient tyrant, but just akin, right? You're not in there specifically giving orders. You're not ruling from the White House. You're not respond. You're not directly responsible for X and Y and Z. So even if you and I think that, we're not going to be able to convince masses of people to think it and actually put the guy in jeopardy. He doesn't have to worry about that kind of thing. This is another great advantage of indirect government. So oh, yeah. John Bennett asked a really good question. I'm going to answer it first uh, just a little bit. Uh, John Bennett says, can an empire with unlimited enforcers be defeated? Imagine Rome with the power of AI, cheap drones, and instant communications. And I'm just going to add one thing to that. That same Periscope I did with John Robb, and I'm not, I invited him here. I'm not sure if he had a chance to make it because there's a lot of people here. But um, was that somebody said that, listen, we – they can't stop us because we can go underground, you know, in terms of the communications being deplatformed and shut out of, of a lot of communications and banking and other types of uh, um, kind of transactional type of stuff that's required to function in a society and communications type of stuff. And uh, I remember John Robb being, uh, I hate to say dismissive of that, but he was like, listen, the reality is uh, if you're deplatformed, you're in a lot, you're in a big jam because there's really not an alternative to it unless you want to live in a cave and you want to just have communications uh, being kind of transmitted person to person from the next town over and the next town over. So um, I, I, when, I, when I saw John Bennett's question, I thought about that. So now John Bennett's question again was, can an empire with unlimited enforcers be defeated? Imagine Rome with the power of AI, cheap drones, and instant communications. Right. Well, I would, first of all, I would say no empire has unlimited enforcers. So that's that's at least a positive. But the, the, the thrust of the question or the spirit of the question is, do these technologies enable tyranny uh, on a scale or uh, of an intensity or for a duration that was not possible in prior uh, epics in history? And the answer to that is we don't yet know. <laughs> there are reasons to believe yes. There are reasons to believe no. I, I do take some comfort from the following. That is to say, the, this doesn't look like a particularly competent or efficient bunch to me, right? These people don't seem to really know what they're doing. I mean, if you think about all of the giant failures of the ruling class just in the past 20 years, failures of all the post 9-11 foreign policy failures, the failures to win wars, the failures just to stay out of stupid wars that don't seem to benefit anyone except defense contractors, maybe, um, the financial crisis, the, just the failures of our elites at every level, they don't really seem to know what they're doing. And you know, if, you, if one were to give AI, cheap drones and instant communication to tyrants of the level of ruthlessness and sophistication and efficiency of, of Lenin and Stalin and Hitler and Mao, that would be terrifying. And maybe we've seen something on a junior level like that in China, where you do have um, a, a much more obviously capable and competent regime running things via technology, right? But the 
as 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 depressing and 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 odious as Biden the, the Biden Harris administration and all of its tech and media and financial enablers are right. These are not geniuses nor efficiency experts. Nor has the whole and the the track record of the ruling class really since the end of the Cold War is quite poor if you think about it. Um, Doesn't that scare you even more that uh, these elites? are that stupid these are like the hereditary yeah. elites i don't know but i mean it's a source of hope it's like what we what, who would you rather be the tyrant you know somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing or someone who absolutely knows what they're doing now it could be if you know when you talked about uh, gottfried earlier saying he would like to be ruled by an authoritarian it's possible to be ruled by an authoritarian who rules for the common good and who likes the perks oh. right uh, okay, well, then you want that person to be efficient. But if the person sort of is a tyrant and is not ruling for the common good, is ruling for their private good, who clearly hates you and your kind and wants to stick it to you, I'd rather have them not be particularly competent. Wow, you're good at this, man. So, uh, and there's so many questions here. I don't know how many of them you can see. There's a lot, though, and really interesting. So, Lemon Minty, thank you so much for joining us. Or I'm not sure if that says Lemon ML Minty, right? Yeah, right. I, it could be an L. I think it might be an L. I'm not and sure. Pharmaceutical companies in 2020 had committed $10 billion to their marketing and advertising budget, just in advertising and marketing alone, then an additional $4 billion into like those Facebook groups and doctor patient advocacy type of things. Uh, and they're holding us hostage now where you're not even allowed to challenge kind of their authority. Uh, so Lemon um, Minty says, and thank you so much again for joining us. And I like that picture, it's very, uh, very pleasant, thank you. It says, anti-vax is a culture, why can't the country accept this? Well, only part of the country uh, doesn't accept it, but it's that it's the part that rules. So, if we, you know, you brought up Machiavelli. If we are, we're going to take it all the way back to Nick again. Um, you know, Nick is the first philosopher who seems to argue that uh, philosophic or scientific authority can be the basis for public rule, something the ancients did not believe, right? And in a way, the, the this previous five hundred years is a working out of that argument. And the, but science or because science, authoritative fist down, Dr. Fauci said argument today is nothing but um, the kind of culmination of that principle, right? Every, all societies have to have an authoritative opinion from which they govern, whether that's biblical, whether it's classical or poetic, whatever it is, right? Ours claims to be based on real knowledge, right? That's the danger or that's that's the the, the new twist is, well, no, this isn't just poetic. This isn't religious. This isn't revealed. We know. We all know this. Therefore, if you deny it or if you doubt, you're essentially denying fact. You're denying reality. It's flat earthism. So if you're at all skeptical of the vi of a vaccine, you're akin to somebody who denies that the earth is round. And, uh, you know, that, that that cannot be allowed to stand as, as kind of, as, as kind of the, the situation that we're in now. And so when... The, when that's the basis for the regime's claim to rule, once you understand that, it's easier to understand why they get so hostile to anybody who says, you know, I'm, I, I want to opt out or I even have doubts. And um, and it's, it's so interesting, right? Because I'm going to follow up with this question. I did an investor series today with uh, Leyland uh, Miller from China Beige Book. It's kind of like the James Bond. And I'd have uh, hopefully everybody here saw it because it was actually excellent discussing china and who really runs china is the u.s following this model um if you follow me on twitter i'm not sure if you do and th and that's from enrico palazzo so thank you so much for joining us says um you know what i i have said uh for years I come, i'm kind of a specialist on certain things within china that uh, it's a leading indicator of the way the u.s is going while as their people operating system can be changed very quickly and very violently uh in a one-party system and in a party in a in a system where uh, violence and is is um, always a couple of words away, their levels of coercion are very immediate and very real in China that Americans don't see. But in America, um, the transformation of our people operating system has to preserve that facade, which is what you were you were saying that the the uh, facades must be preserved uh, to give the appearance of continuity. So I think that China is a leading indicator of where we're going. It's different. Uh, it's a one-party system, which is much different, even though Democrats and Republicans are still much different. But I think they are a leading indicator. In fact, you can take a look kind of in their industry. Um, and, you know, you can even look at Yiming and um, Tortao. And there's just so many companies that I could get into. I love this type of stuff. 
but I'm not going to get into it. Um, do you have anything to respond to that? I mean, I, I, from what I can tell, I mean, I've been to China, I think, three times, so I'm not, not nothing like a China expert. Um, it looks, you know, the, China is more an example of direct rule than indirect rule, right? There, the, Xi Jinping runs China. There is a, there is a, a, a party. There is a, 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 I don't know what they call it. It's not the Politburo. It's the Party Congress, I think, is the, when they meet together. There is sort of an inner party and an outer party. And then there is this network of party-connected businessmen who are allowed and encouraged to get rich so long as they do so in ways that further the state's interests. And so long as they never run afoul of the state and they take direction when the state wants to give them direction about China's role in the world. Those are the people who rule China, it seems to me. Um, and if I were to, you know, if you were to ask me, I, I, you know, here's a great example, right? Do you remember earlier this year, but somehow Jack, I forgot the details, but somehow Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, which at one point may still be, um, but it was when it happened, was the largest IPO in the history of capital markets, right? When did that happen? Like 20, anyway, in the early 2000s. Um, he ran afoul over the regime somehow and kind of just disappeared for a while. And then when he came back, he was very chastened and, you know, kind of like, being so a good their own version of that. What, so, um, give me But it shows who's in charge, right? You can't imagine the US government doing that to Bezos or Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey or, or Jamie Dimon or David Solomon. It's impossible. The so, Chinese, though, the regime has the power to do that to the people with the money who run the companies. And that shows you that the rule there is much more over, in a sense, overt and direct. It's a different people operating system. So there in China, the Chinese Communist Party infuses itself into the businesses. The, the businesses like Alibaba are really a front for the Chinese Communist Party and also for their own money laundering to get it out of China. And there's a whole bunch of things that go on. But so the Chinese Communist Party is kind of the host of um, of Alibaba and, and some of the other companies there, Tencent, um, while as in America, it's exactly the opposite. So they have a political type of system over there. In America, ours is much more kind of fiscalized. I think that's a term that Julian Assange used. And in America, it's exactly the opposite. So during Hillary's election, we saw Google, Groundworks, Eric Schmidt, we saw them employ all of their force, really brute force to get Hillary elected. And so much so that uh, they infuse themselves in a state department in the center for American progress um, in Brookings. Yeah, my, my point is simply this, Hillary and the, the, the government, the people who are supposedly have power, right? If, if you, you know, in Aristotle's terms, question who rules? Well, you'd first look at who are the office holders, right? The office holders cannot bring Eric Schmidt and Google to heel, but Google can bring the office holders to heel. In China, the reverse is true. Oh, I see that John Robb's here. That's awesome. I didn't know you said there's a lot of comments here and I try and grill through them. Um, you guys should, uh, should I mean, he's, um, again, I'll do a periscope. I'll make an introduction on a different day. So John Robb's is society uh, as a technological artifact. I don't, I'm not sure what that means. I don't, I don't know how to respond to it. Yeah. I'd like them. Uh, I, I'd like them to expand on that a little bit and I'm going to see, I'm going to, I'm scrolling down right now because they also, um, commented on digital rights, which I see is something that they're very big on. Um, and they think it's obtainable to have kind of like a digital bill of rights and kind of a data ownership which would be kind of part of a retaking, I suppose, of our sovereignty. I'd love to see that. And I, I just, I, I keep going back to the notion that anything that the regime feels will threaten its power, it will stop. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, it hasn't been able to stop Bitcoin. And I see that Bitcoin is actually hitting new highs uh, right now. Yeah, I, you know, friends of mine follow this very carefully. So, and I, I admit I don't, I, I couldn't even, I, I couldn't even explain to, you know, somebody what the basic terms what a blockchain is I, I don't understand it however i have noticed that they have been going after bitcoin lately it seems like it's trouble like the regime the, both the, the financial parts of the regime and the government regulatory parts of the regime realize this thing could be a threat and they're they're, they're finding their way they're trying to think through ways to, to to mess with it or head it off at the past so if i were bitcoin i mean i don't i mean i don't even know if the guy what's the the Japanese name of the fake person who supposedly invented it, who probably isn't real, right? So there is no Bitcoin and there's nobody behind Bitcoin, but if I owned it or if I had anything to do with it, I'd be worried. Well, 
perhaps worried, but it's, it's, now, it's now at a new that thing, right? This person probably does not exist. No, I think they, I actually do. I think there was a syndicate. There was a small kind of a, a syndicate and kind of this kind of a conspiracy to get some type of a price history on it. I love this type of stuff. It's going to be boring for everybody. I've been so horrible. You have a book, right? Yeah. And I, um, here it I, is to cover. It is. And would you be kind enough to uh, discuss your book? Because we've got discussed so much, except how somebody can kind of capture more of you. Yeah, it, it came out September 1st. Um, that is the title, The Stakes, America at the Point of No Return. So it, it seems like it's an election book. It kind of is. It culminates in saying you should vote for, we should reelect Trump. And the last chapter is a you know suggested agenda for the second term. But I would say the last chapter is a suggested agenda for you know populist, nationalist, populist policy for anybody, whether that's a federal candidate, a state candidate, a local candidate, that these are the things that we need to do. Um, more fundamentally, the book is a kind of regime analysis. It says, all right, you know, political science is about the regime. How, how are we ruled? Who rules us and how are we ruled? I know what the parchment, what I call the parchment says, but we're not ruled that way anymore. And I try to explain how we actually are ruled. And uh, I try to look forward, not to make predictions, but to say, these are the paths that I see. These are the various potential forks in the road, how it might go, how that might look. I make no claim to knowing any of these things. I don't even try to handicap them in terms of probability. I just say, you know, well, I do that a little bit, but mostly I just say, these are the possibilities. And so um, again, to kind of come back to something we had been talking about earlier, I don't think what they have, I don't think what the regime has now can go on forever for the simple reason that nothing can go on forever. But even then, I mean like more near term than long term. Like, are we going to be living in blue managerial wokeism for another hundred years, 500 years to, I mean, no. 50 seems unlikely 40 maybe at the outside 10 or 20 now i don't know but my sense is it's going to be we're still going to be alive when this thing breaks or fundamentally shakes and so we ought to all start thinking about where where it goes when that happens uh i'm going to skip around a little bit would that be all right because i've uh Somebody asked me an interesting question, and it's about something else that you've written. So, um, Ilya Nastase, I hope I said that right. Um, I'm not sure how to, how I would pronounce that. So, if you uh, please accept, uh, please accept my uh, likely mispronunciation in the best of spirits. It says, are you ever going to let him finish? That's me telling the origin story of um, the Flight 93 election. All right. So, I wrote this article that the CRB rejected. I ended up hooking up with some guys who in a similar position and. Together, we started a blog called the Journal of American Greatness, it, and it was a very brief lived thing. It went up on February of 16 and came down in June of 16. And it was, you know, a, a handful of people, all pseudonymous, no promotion, no budget, no nothing. All of us with full time jobs, all of us just doing it at nights and on the weekends. And it grew to this thing bigger than any of us kind of ever thought it would be. And you know, some of the guys got nervous and decided to pull the plug on it. And I was working a corporate job in New York at the time. And I just thought, all right, well, that's that. I'm not going to do this again. And the same <laughs> editor who rejected my earlier piece contacted me in the middle of the summer and said, hey, do you want to write something on the election? And I said, no, you know, I'll, I, I'd rather keep my, you know, I'd rather remain employed. Because I figured if people, if my employer knew I was, they'd fire me. I'm sure that's true. Uh, and then I just got irritated enough. I went and visited a friend of mine in California and we stayed up late talking about it. And I was like, you know what the hell? I'm going to write something. I don't care anymore. Like, whatever. They can fire me. And I wrote it. And I thought, hmm, this is actually maybe a little hot. Maybe I shouldn't. And I showed it to my wife. And I said, you know, you're, you're, my income is your income. So if I get fired, in a sense, you get fired. So if you don't want me to do this, uh, don't worry about it. Like, I have no hard feelings. And she, she read it. And she said, no, you have to do it. And so I did it. And I still didn't really think anything would come of it because I thought that everything that was said in it was already said in the journal of American greatness. And that if you recognize, and it's also pseudonymous, like who reads pseudonymous pieces, unless you know the pseudonym and you've read the person before. So if you recognize the pseudonym, you go, okay, I already heard all this in Jag. So what do I care? If you didn't recognize the pseudonym, you wouldn't read it because you'd say, I don't know this moron, you know, this pretentious ass using a Roman name is, so why should I care? Well, somebody got it to Rush Limbaugh. I don't know who or how, and Limbaugh basically spent the entirety of a three hour show on a Wednesday. I think it was September 7th, 2016, re just reading the essay. And it crashed 
the Claremont Institute website. And so friends of mine who had started American Greatness as a kind of outgrowth of JAG put it on their website and then it crashed into their website and then it just became this thing. And it's still, it's now four and a half years later. And I'm, I'm amazed that it's at its shelf life. People still, people still refer to it and people still talk about it. Usually, wow. I mean, not always negatively, but usually, you know, most of the media coverage of it is like, that's, not friendly, let's put it that way. That's fascinating. And uh, so I see um, Chuck has joined us. So thank you so much. Chuck and I actually met on Twitter and then we did uh, two Periscopes. He, uh, he said some really interesting comments and I want to get to his comment here, but on a Periscope that we did where we were talking about Birdwatch, if everybody knows what Birdwatch is, we haven't really seen it rolled out yet. But Birdwatch is this kind of uh, what Rising Serpent calls digital antifa. And one of the ways that Chuck described it is, and I'm going to miss say it. So, you know, it was close to, this is close to what he said, is that it uh, it kind of uh, creates or empowers psychopaths. Uh, it gives them it gives them tools to uh, psychopaths. I'm sure I'm misstating the way he said it, but nevertheless, nevertheless, it gives these self help tools um, to psychopaths so they can. If you tweet something, they can put an annotation to it. Do you follow me? And that annotation really becomes the tweet because it comes from a blue check. So if you if I tweet something and then a blue check sees it, they can annotate, they can put a comment to my tweet. And really what's happening is their comment becomes the yeah. record of my tweet. It, and it does create psychopaths. So Charles, thank you so much. Chuck, thank you so much for being here. Says uh, we're stuck on an intellectual flatland. Yeah, that's another kind of aphoristic thing. I'm not sure exactly what it means. I mean, we are stuck spinning our wheels intellectually. This is not a great time of ferment that scholars of the future are going to look back on and say, wow, look at this plethora of texts and great art that we have to study to learn about the human condition. I think this is kind of a tin age at best. We have a contempt for beauty. Did you know that? I think about this hatred. a lot. It's, it's worse than contempt. It's, it's hatred. It's resentment. Or as Nietzsche put it, ressentiment. Right? It's a kind of deep abiding anger and envy combined with resentment. And there's a lot of questions here, so we're going to rip through them, but I know it's getting late for everybody. Um, have you been able to see any of the questions on your side? I don't really yeah, know. Do. They're interesting, right? They're good questions. So I see whatever one you put up. No, no, look at the comments yourself and then tell me. Uh, oh, so I don't see the ones on the side. I'm, I'm just seeing the ones that you pop up. So. Oh, no, there's a lot of questions on the side. So Lemon Minty, again, thank you so much. Tell me what this means. I'm not good at this stuff. What okay. about? <laughs> so I'll let, you, I'll let you say the question. I don't even know. Uh, what about the Hegelian dialectic at work? All right. So this is George. Uh, uh, I hope I have his name right. Georg Friedrich Hegel. I think it's Friedrich, right? Um, I have his books <laughs> behind me right here. Admittedly, I I haven't uh, I haven't read them uh, in a long time. Uh, yeah, there he is. Hegel's uh, Phenomenology of Spirit. Uh, the one of the more dismal ones. Uh, I haven't looked at it in grad school. The only one I've looked at since grad school is the philosophy of history, which thankfully is the one maybe most relevant to this question. So uh, Hegel takes an insight from the classics. And in a way, it's a similar insight to Machiavelli, that there are kind of fundamentally two, in, in the political realm, two types of souls, a very assertive, in Greek, the word would be thumatic, uh, or spirited soul, and a more kind of passive soul, right? And he, he can, you know, or Machiavelli calls them the people and the great, il grandi and il popoli. This is in Prince 9 and also in Discourses 1, Chapter 4 and Chapter 5 and elsewhere, but th those are the main places. So in Machiavellian terms, the great desire to command and oppress the people and the people desire not to be commanded or oppressed. And for him, this is just a permanent dichotomy and it never goes away. So Hegel redefines this as the master and the slave. So the master is the thumatic one and the slave is the one who's passive. And he says essentially the definition of a master is a type of person who has a soul who would rather be dead than, than be dishonored, right? And that any time two different, you know, human, anytime the master comes into contact with another human being, he either forces that human being to submit to his will. What the master most wants is recognition for himself without having to give recognition to the other person, right? You submit to me, you recognize my existence and my superiority, but I don't recognize you. And when, he, when one master runs into another master, then it's a death struggle as to who's going to stay alive. And event, it's like, you think of it like a, you know, I'm simplifying here, but like a nature documentary about bull elephant seals. 
when two really super alpha bulls get together, only one's coming out alive, right? Now, but for Hegel, this is not permanent. That is to say, the dialectic is the working out over centuries, over millennium, this process where you eventually get to a resolution. And there are stages to the dialectic. So thesis, the thesis meets antithesis, creates synthesis, and so on until you get to the final state, which is mutual recognition for all. Hegel says occurred uh, at the Battle of Jena, <laughs> which happened to be like outside his office window. <laughs> A slight exaggeration. In, if I recall correctly, the Battle of Jena is 1806. I remember Austerlitz is 1805. So this happens at the Battle of Jena, and history ends. That is to say, events do not end, but the process of history, the working out of the dialectic ends, and we have universal recognition. And universal recognition takes place uh, in what we would call today the liberal society, um, which in principle could become and will or should eventually become a one world society, a one world government in which there's universal recognition for all human beings and all mankind. Wow. That was a good question. Nancy, can you explain that to me later? Can you explain that to me later? That was tough. Uh, that was awesome. That was for really those interested. If you want like the the clip notes version, get a copy of uh, History of Political Philosophy by Leo Strauss and Joseph Cropsey, which is a bunch of shortish twenty to thirty page essays summarizing the great political philosophers. And the article on Hegel in that uh, in that volume by Pierre Hasner is a pretty good. I've got you know, that. I've got well, that in there. I'm not down there yet. I think I'm still like reading Aristotle or is that, is that right? Is that what it, it lists all of the. Well, they, I mean, it's curated. So, you know, they made choices as to who to include in there and who not to include, but Hegel's definitely in there. Well, I'm not down to that yet. I've got a while to go. I'm reading them. I think it's chronological. Well, you don't have to read them in order. I mean, you can just read whichever one you want. So in any yeah. order you want. I'm really glad you asked that question. And now I am going to read that. So thank you very much. Oh, uh, wow. Right. And, um, I think I recognize that picture. I think that's Aaron. Uh, so uh, who now, Aaron Lockhart, I think, right? So, and if it's not, then my apologies. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. It says a rabbit or a duck. Uh, and again, an interesting question about the language. I am not a conservative, but I would be hesitant if I had kind of a, a bias that way. I would not want to call myself conservative because it's been a term that's been demonized and I wouldn't be able to explain it. So they say, I prefer to be an anti-Marxist rather than a conservative from now on. Uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm more sanguine about ditching conservatism and I'm, I'm perfectly happy to be an anti-Marxist and I am an anti-Marxist, but I would like to see, you know, I, I think we need a more positive, you know, we can't just be anti, we gotta be for something. I'm not sure what we're for. I mean, I know what we're for. I don't know how I would sum it up in a name yet. I'm not that good, you know, if Tom Wolfe, one of my literary heroes, we're around today. Talk about an expert coiner of phrases. So many phrases he coined are, are part of the conversation and will be probably forever, as long as people read books. Um, I'm not, I, I don't have that gift, so I'm not sure. But I think just just solely defining yourself as anti-anything is not, it's not ideal. It's not, it's not good. You're going to have to be pro something. What would you be pro? Well, I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, the, as a label, you know, pro-civilization, it doesn't exactly trip off the tongue. Um, I was, we were, you know, I was on one of my little chats today, my group chats today, we were talking about this. It's like, well, what would we be? And I said, we just have a pro, like, what about normality? Just like normal. You know, well, let's, we let's just want a grill. I suggested we form a secret society called the grill masters, right? I mean, it's just a dumb kind of tongue in cheek joke, but it's like, all we want to do is just live normal, ordinary lives without oppressive, woke BS and anti-nature ideologies bearing down on us 24 seven. So you know what that is? You're pro Tom Cruise, right? Oh, I guess, sure. You're pro Tom Cruise. Uh, me too, right? So um, JD12, JD, and there's a lot of questions. We're going to start ripping through these now, right? Because it's getting late. So, but you're awesome. I did this with Amanda Milius, who's so awesome. It went for four and a half hours, and we still kept on going. Um, afterwards, we were like still talking. So, uh, so JD123, JD. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. It says this conversation is hope in itself. This information exchange um, and a video revolution is a this information exchange via video revolution is a game changer. I think the conversation is very hopeful. I've had conversations with a lot of people. I think people need to re-engage. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know what you mean by re-engage. I mean, I'm sort of half connected and half disconnected. That is to say, I'm pretty well disconnected from uh, the mainstream media at this point. I, like, I don't, I just don't, I don't read it. I don't pay that much attention to it anymore. Uh, I, I know what they think. I don't, I don't really care. I don't feel like I can learn anything from them. And, and they're, I know they're not listening to me. So I'm just doing my own thing. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm talking to people who want to talk, who I think are willing to talk in good faith or whatever. That, that seems to be worth it. But like trying to, to actually change the more public conversation around it, I, I just don't. The way it is now, I don't see many openings there. Let me put it that way. At least not for somebody like me. I think uh, people are still fighting. Um, I call this the trolley problem. And we're, we're going to get to the questions. Uh, and the comments, I call this the trolley problem. And what the elites have done is they have put this problem in front of everybody and commanded that they solve it. So they have to solve the trolley problem, right? And not only do they have to solve it, but they've got to present their solution in the front of the class and have the uh, class give them their unanimous agreement that that's the workable solution to the trolley problem. And that's an impossible thing to achieve in a society that's so torn apart by centrifugal force um, and a party where everybody is like so um, and a country and a world where everybody is so solipsistic, it's just impossible to achieve that. So I think of this as the trolley problem. I hope people will emotionally disengage from that problem and start fighting the real battles because people today, a year later, are still talking about the efficacy of masks, the efficacy of vaccines. And that's clearly a mechanism that's been employed to create confusion. You know, though, yes, I. It, it was a weird thing. Like when the virus happened, I don't. I don't think anybody knew what it was, or was it, or how it was going to play out. And it took a month or two, or it took a little while before it was. The partisan lines got drawn around, and then we knew where it was all going. Like. I personally, I mean, call me whatever name you want as having been wrong about this, but in the beginning, the first, say, four to six weeks, I, I was withholding judgment. Like, I was willing to believe, wow, this could be just a horrible pandemic. It could kill a lot of people. We know from history that this happens. Right back to Thucydides, right? There's the plague. Remember the plague that kills a third of the Athenians in, in a year or something like but that. How so, did the plague start? How did the huh? plague start? Nobody, nobody ever knows how the plague started. Day, nobody, knows. nobody even knows what it was. All they can do is read the description in Thucydides of the symptoms and speculate. So, you know, there's no, there's no way to, there's no way to know. Um, after a while, I started to realize, okay, or at least I came to my conclusions about what I thought it was and that this was a giant overreaction and that we foolishly locked down and all of this stuff. And I, I think now that we're well over a year into it, I don't, I don't have much doubt about that anymore. But, you know, remember we said about the authority of science, right? Well, it's, it's become this authoritative thing. You must believe you have to wear them. I mean, I, I wear it when I go places that require it because I want to go to those places. And so, you know, I'm not going to just stay home forever, uh, but I, it's now pretty clear to me that this is um, a regime flex on the population. I learned, I, you know, I get old and I learn all these terms that I didn't know that the kids use today, but what, what is a flex as a noun, right? It's, it's a, it's a sort of naked exercise of power to show you who's the boss. And so that's what that that seems to me what a lot of these mandates and lockdowns amount to. I knew from day one that um, that it was inauthentic, that there was a virus. Obviously, it is undeniable that there was a virus and that, it you know, it, it was spreading and that there was a kind of a cryptic transmission that was occurring and it had already occurred. But I knew that uh, once I saw those videos being leaked out of China, that that was uh, not genuine because of Chinese discourse power, that they wouldn't allow that to diffused through Twitter if it was genuine. And um, so I saw people saying, wear masks, wear masks. And they were, um, they were, they were right in that way, but they were uh, answering, they were right that they answered the, the wrong question. Does, does that make sense? So they were right because they answered the wrong question correctly. Um, so if I was to give somebody a multiple choice and all of the answers are wrong, the fact that uh, that they chose B is just as right as having them chose solution C. I knew I, I that's why I started this history of the fastest rollable power in history, because I no longer even talk to people about it. 
because the brain is being overwhelmed and I can't really compete with it. George Soros wrote something called the theory of reflexivity. Um, and uh, it's really interesting because it describes kind of the behavior of these type of things. And so we're going to start looking at the last questions and we're all going to go. There's a lot of people still here. And I just appreciate everybody so, so much. It says America is not the common property of all mankind. It was amazing. It needs to be linked to more. What is that? That's an article I wrote for the American Greatness website. Um, 2018. I don't remember exactly what month, but it should still be findable online. And it was just a, a, an argument, a fairly extensive long form argument against um, immigration enthusiasts who basically say we have an obligation to let as many people into the country as want to come. And I said, no, we don't. <laughs> and then here I will meet, I think I will meet, you know, six arguments or something and, and, and answer them. That's what that is. And we're going to look at one last question and then we're going to go back to your book and close it up. So everybody, I want to thank everybody so much. Actually, the question was this one though. Uh, why let them take away conservatism? And it's an interesting question that uh, Riley Serpent had asked, I asked Ryan, right, Ryan Williams, I think that uh, people should kind of abandon the term. And then Micro Mazuma, thank you so much for joining us. And it's, uh, it's a nice picture in the countryside with a lot of people wearing uh, MAGA hats, right? Yeah. Says, uh, so uh, Miko Mazuma, thank you so much for joining us. Miko Mazuma, right? Why let them take away conservatism? Shouldn't we fight for what we believe in? Yeah, I mean, but but conservatism is a label. It's not what we believe in. If if it's an accurate and useful, it, something could be accurate and still not useful, right? What if the argument is that, and I'm not even taking a side on this necessarily uh, or insisting, but the argument is that conservatism as a label, whether it's accurate or not, even if it is accurate, has outlived its usefulness. It doesn't help us win converts or appeal to people. If it, you know, as I said, like I told you, there's a lot of people that I hear from red america ordinary non-political people but who are you know uh, well i shouldn't say non i mean like not political professionals but who are trump supporters or at least support some kind of idea of populism that we're talking about here who say that word doesn't resonate with me it doesn't resonate with my family it doesn't resonate with my friends it doesn't resonate at my church at my workplace like i don't people are not into this in in wherever in the ohio valley in the great plains and you know the oil fields and the gas fields of the dakotas they're not you can't you go there and say like i'm conservative the way um the the word did resonate for a while reagan made it very popular and it, it was you could win congressional and, and state level and other elections just pounding that word over and over again in the 80s and 90s and maybe even into the 2000s if if you know uh People are telling me it doesn't resonate anymore. Uh, I take it seriously. Now I'm not a political professional in the sense that, like, you, you, you'd want to have pollsters look at it and see how, you know, how how it's doing and all of that. But going all the way back to the '90s, um, I think we already were starting to see the limits of the term uh, when Pat Buchanan Pat Buchanan ran for president three times. Uh, essentially, as a kind of somebody, as somebody put it, as a John the Baptist to, to Trump's Jesus. That is to say, he had kind of the same message, but he didn't get anywhere. It took somebody else to to get it across the finish line, right? But he ran in 92, 96, 90, and 2000 on the, on a very similar trade, immigration, and foreign policy platform that Trump would win on in 2016. And he had some people around him advising, like, don't describe this as conservatism. When the people you're trying to appeal to hear conservatism, they think Kemp. They think Reagan, they think the DC establishment, and you're running against that. So come, you know, define yourself as being middle American or, you know, a middle America, um, what, you know, something like that. And Buchanan, because he was from that era, right? I mean, he was, he was a big booster of Ronald Reagan his whole career, worked in the Reagan White House, um, considered himself kind of Mr. Conservative in a lot of ways, um, didn't take the advice. He was too wet into the term. I don't know what would have, I'm not saying he would have won the presidency had he taken the advice. I'm just saying he, uh, this argument about the word, about the term, about the utility of the term goes back a long way. The conservatism emerges as a, as a term that's helpful to Republicans probably in the 50s because of Buckley. Buckley makes conservatism um, vital and intellectually attractive and, uh, and even politically attractive again uh, and that wave probably crests with Reagan and is already starting to peter out in the 90s. And we have to ask ourselves in the 2020s, does conservatism motivate a national uh, majority anymore? I think it clearly doesn't motivate a national majority. But is it even a good word to run on uh, for uh, a Republican 
party that can't command a national majority, but that's looking to rack up statewide and local victories. I'm just saying that's a legitimate question. I don't know the answer. Maybe yeah. it's not. Nancy, what do you think of the word conservative? What do I think it means? Or what no, what do you think? If somebody says they're conservative, what does that mean to you? I mean, I automatically just think of, you know, conservative beliefs. Yeah, yeah. We know a lot of people that are uh, immigrants, that are very devotional people, particularly immigrants and kind of lower... Um, uh, that are uh, recent immigrants, Muslims, um, many people who are just wonderful. Many of them are black and minority, and uh, they voted for Trump, actually. So I don't, but I don't know whether they would be conservatives or just kind of detesting the intrusions into the public libraries um, and kind of other ways where you're seeing kind of the vulnerability of children being exploited. Uh, Stocks and Scotch, who uh, is awesome. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, Harry Krishna. Um, says, and you gotta come to New York City. Says, Stocks and Scotch says, Sty Fi bro here. Hopefully, Anton understands. Please tell him we miss him there. Come back. What does that mean? Uh, it was so one of my hobbies, it's not so much anymore. I'm kind of out of the game in a way, but was clothing for a long time. And I actually wrote a book about suits. Uh, my first book was of all things about suits and ties. And um, there's a style, it's still around called Style Forum, and it's a, just a message board. Um, and I used to be pretty active on it when I was really into that. And I, I hadn't been on it in a long time. And, um, you know, part of it is I bought I bought a lot of clothes when I kind of needed them. I built up a wardrobe of a lot of different stuff. I'm no longer a daily commuter. I'm no longer going to a Manhattan office every day. So I don't need to wear suits and ties like I did anymore. And now I'm a college professor. You know, if it's the winter, I wear tweed. And if it's the summertime, I wear linen. And I kind of have everything I need. So I'm probably, uh, I think I'm pretty much pretty much done with that. I mean, maybe if I get, you know, if I get super fat and I can't fit into anything anymore, I'll call up my, but also too, unfortunately right now, tailors aren't traveling. I mean, um, I did actually try to get a couple of suits. I own a bunch of stupidly, I, you know, I bought a lot of cloth and I got, a, you know, I call it my cloth cellar. It's like a wine cellar, except you can't drink it. The only way you can do anything with it is you give it to a tailor and he makes it into a suit. And so I was like, all right, well, you know, I, maybe I need another suit. And I sent a piece of cloth to my, to one of my tailors in England like last, I don't know when. And of course the guy was gonna come over and cut it, give me a fitting, but he's been, he can't because there's no, no transatlantic, I mean, there might be some by now, but he canceled the trip. So I, I haven't heard from him in a while. So maybe I'll get one one more suit one of these days if the guy ever comes back over, but otherwise I just don't think I'm- um, Do you know, I've, I've, back seen, I've seen videos of you even kind of recently, and do you know you've lost weight? Did you know that? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, this is the, the, anyway. You lost weight, man. That's good for you. So I there's a couple of comments, and we're, and we're going to close. The only reason I bring it up is because it's Lent, and every Lent I, I go completely off. I'm kind of a wine connoisseur, and um, I go completely off wine, and I usually lose some weight during Lent. And I've been like keeping track, and well, this Lent eh, hasn't been uh, hasn't been falling off the way it usually does. So yeah, and so we have a um, question here, and let me see if I can. Bring it up. Oh, it was up. So, Horse Caligia, how would you, um, how would you destabilize the? And it's Horse Caligia, which was what? Is that uh, in, in so, uh, You know, it's the famous the Emperor Caligula made his horse a senator. Wasn't that like Incitatus? Incitatus? What was the name of the horse? Incite. Oh, that I don't remember. Incitat. You see, oh, you, you, yeah. learn the, you see, you learn things, right? Right. So, Incitatus, I think, was it. Um, it's, in, uh, it's in Tacitus and it's in Suetonius. I just don't remember. I don't remember the horse's name. Yeah, but it's also on Plutarch, right? It's in Plutarch. No, there's no Plutarch life of. Uh, I no know. Oh, darn it! I tried to get you with that one. Okay. There's, no Plutarch of, uh, there's a Plutarch Caesar, and then there's no other. I didn't write any other emperors' lives. I tried to get you with that one. You know that? <laughs> I thought it'd be cool. Okay, so Horace Caligula, thank you so much for joining us. Says, how would you destabilize the hive mind? For each lefty draws strength from it, but alone, they're weak. Uh, excellent question. I give this a lot of thought. I haven't come up with an answer. Um, I don't know. Um, chip away, I guess. Um, I, you know, meme warfare seems to be, meme warfare seems to upset them a lot and keep them off balance. I'm not particularly good at it, but I, I appreciate the people who are good at it and do it and and, and make fun of them and ridicule. Um, you know. I, deeper, better arguments. Um, and this is, a, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm on a lot, I'm on a number of group chats where I'm talking to certain friends pretty much all day. 
Uh, and uh, this is one of the things we talk about all the time. I don't think anybody has a particularly great answer yet for how to do it. And there's a follow up to that. And um, and I want to say, did uh, do you know the term 4D warfare that Jack Posobiec coined? I, I certainly do. And I just read another article about it the other day uh, and, you know, and, and the transition to 5D warfare. You know, I'm still trying to think this through. It's interesting, though, right? Because, uh, you know, this is everything he was saying, you know, I guess now almost five years ago, right? Uh, about kind of mean warfare. And it's interesting for you to say that uh, it is that effective and it is kind of a tactic. Well, I, it must have been effective. Otherwise, the um, otherwise the regime wouldn't have cracked down on it as hard as it did. I mean, I just, that's not dispositive, but it's suggestive to me. Like, why would you be, why would the regime panic so much about, now, for instance, did you see this thing about, um, there's a prosecution going on right now, a federal prosecution, no less, against a guy who was tweeting memes in 2016 and they're trying to I did see that they're trying to string him up for saying that he somehow violated people's voting rights or something or other or whatever and five years later he gets arrested and arraigned and he's now being tried in, in, a, in a federal prosecution for memes from 2016 they, they, they wouldn't do this if they if they weren't really freaked out about the power of memes and the power of, of, of this kind of thing. It, it's so, it's just, it's too transparent otherwise. Wow, that's really interesting. I learned about that. Again, I use Twitter to curate my reality. I suck a lot of information off of Twitter because again, I'm writing the uh, this chronicle of the fastest roll up of power in history because I know in 10, 20, 30 years, the elites will want to look back and see what happened because right now they are a boxer. They're Muhammad Ali or Sugar Ray Leonard, right? Slugging their opponent. They've got them up against the ropes and they're just pounding away at their opponent. But in about 10 years, 20 years, they're going to want to step back from their opponent and uh, observe all the damage that they inflicted and just kind of uh, do a recap on how this happened, right? You know, they're going to want to replay the whole fight and see how they got into the corner and how they pummeled their opponent. And, uh, there, and there won't be any historians. So uh, it's just going to be me, kind of. I got the market cornered on history. You like that? Well, I just say that's a f catchphrase of mine that I say all the time. I don't think I've ever actually used it in print. But, you know, I say, you know, history will look back on X. And then I always pause and say, if history is ever again written by honest men, <laughs> which we cannot take for granted. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think we're going to have to start closing up. What do you think? Okay. I'm going to um, go eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me too. Me too. I've got to eat. I, uh, and it's going to be difficult a little bit for me now, right? Because I told you what happened to me right before this. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to have to eat gently, right? I'm going to have to eat really gently now. Yeah. I know. So we're going to close up in a last discussion of your book. And I know uh, throughout, I'm not sure how many of the comments you saw, but right now I know that you, um, you write regularly for uh, American Greatness. Right for I don't really write regularly for anywhere. I'm a very sporadic writer. So I go through, sometimes I go through these periods of just frenetic activity where I churn out piece after piece. And sometimes I just, so, and lately too, so I have a fairly heavy, I have three courses this semester. I know people who really work a real full-time job probably look at that and go, oh, boo-hoo. But it's actually, if you do it right and you, and you, you know, write a lecture for every single class and you make sure you explain all the readings and tie it together thematically. It takes up a ton of time. And so this semester, I've been very busy uh, prepping my lectures uh, um, more thoroughly than I've ever done uh, and just trying to be super conscientious about that. And I haven't had a ton of time to write. So I did write, I had a piece out in the Claremont Review of Books that came out in February on the election and the aftermath. I had a piece on American greatness, eh, I don't know, two weeks ago about my experience on the Andrew Sullivan show. Um, and then I did a piece up of all places today, just came out today on Law and Liberty about the weather underground. Um, I don't have anything else in the works right now. I'm, I've been asked to review a couple of books. Hopefully I'll get around to that. Um, <clears throat> one on Texas and California, like a comparison, and then one on one on the, on the American founding. So probably I'll get both of those done. Uh, and then after that, you know, I don't have any, I started writing something that I found really amusing that I'd like to finish, but I don't have time to do it right now. So it just started as a lark. I started writing like a parody or pastiche of Plato's Republic 
if it were if Socrates was super woke, like like you know, but just but following the structure pretty carefully. So I wrote book one of the woke republic. Yeah. I actually call it Beto's Republic. Um, and then I have an outline for books two through ten, how how it would play out exactly the way the argument goes in Plato and parallels and everything. I think I could do it. The problem is I just don't right now I don't have time. Eventually I'll I, I I'm amused enough by it that I would like to get back to it and finish it. Uh, the Beto's Republic. I'd be afraid to read it. You know why? Because I'm reading. In fact, I just went over some of uh, Republic yesterday. I read a lot of this stuff. Yeah, you know, I think it's like so. The book that I did on clothes, which I referenced earlier, is is a parody of The Prince, and it's it works. It's the same structure, twenty six chapters. Instead of being about how to rule, it's about how to dress, right? If you know the prince well, the book will be funny because you'll you'll get how I'm playing with him and parroting him and using his stuff. The same way I'd like to believe, and I've, I've shown book one of Beto's Republic to several of my grad school and academic friends who know and teach the Republic, really teach it a lot. And they're like, this is pretty good. Like you have, a, you know, I captured book one fairly accurately. I mean, it's, it's different. The characters are different. The arguments are similar enough, but different enough. Anyway, what I found in writing it is basically it's easy to parody and make, and bring it up to date for our time. All you have to do is one of two things because Plato is so radical, right? You either just port in exactly what Plato said, right? And it actually jibes with wokeness or you just turn it around. You just turn whatever argument he's making in the moment, 180 degrees different. So like as an example, Book one is characterized, but there's three conversations or three definitions of justice, each of which Socrates refutes. The, the old man, Cephalus, gives a definition, right? Justice is paying your debts and telling the truth. Socrates refutes that. Second is his son, um, Polemarchus, says it's helping friends and harming enemies. And Socrates refutes that. And then Thrasymachus is the third definition is justice is the interest of the stronger, meaning whatever the ruling order wants, might makes right. And then Socrates refutes that. And then book two begins, right? So all you have to, so the Cephalus conversation, I basically keep the same. The Thrasymachus conversation, I basically keep the same. Because so, it's making the same point for it. And then the Polemarchus conversation, you just flip instead of justice is helping friends and harming enemies. Polemarchus says it's, it's, it's helping the deserving and harming no one and Wokrates, <laughs> who's the Socrates stand in, says, no, no, justice, justice, we have to prove that justice actually does require harming certain people, which I think the woke believe, right? Justice does require harm, right? If you have privilege, we have to take stuff from you. We've got to hurt you. You have it coming. So all you gotta do, all you gotta do to do this parody is you either you 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 find the things that you can port in without changing. And then there are certain things that you realize all you gotta do is just just hold the mirror up to it and just show the opposite and it worked. I, I'm pretty sure I could write the whole book that way. It would be really good. And it would also confuse me because after a while I'd forget which one I'm reading. <laughs> no, mine's a lot shorter. <laughs> I the actual think... Republic is, I don't know. I've got, I mean, I, of course, because I'm a Straussian, I use the Bloom translation, which is, uh, let's see, 300 pages. Like mine's not gonna be even, even close to that. Um, my book one, I think, is only about 3,000 words. It's like 10 pages. It's going to be, I can get this sucker done in like 50, you know, well, maybe not 50 pages, but certainly under 100. You've been awesome. How long do you think this Periscope went? Don't look at the time. Just tell me how long, how long do you think? Um, at least three hours. Three hours and seven minutes. Okay. You know that? Isn't that incredible? I yeah. have such a good time. And uh, I want to thank you again. And uh, we'll close with discussion of your book, The Stakes, again, because I know that you went pretty much into the chapters. I, I actually I just uh, watched some YouTubes with you, especially the one with Jack Murphy, because I like his interview style. You and, know, there's uh, a good one that Ryan did, uh, if you want to watch it. And then I basically do go through it. Um, it just should be on the Claremont Institute's website. Anyway, eight Ryan, chapters. It starts off with an account of California and why California is a basket case. My home state, which I no longer live in, uh, I haven't for a while and almost certainly never will again. Um, uh, you know, I go through California and it, I try to be funny, but it's kind of mordant humor. Like it's, you know, it's ultimately not funny. And then the chapter two is what the founders meant, what the, what America is supposed to look like. But also I, I take on critics of it, you know, right wing critics, left wing critics. Chapter three is the regime analysis of, how we are actually governed today. Chapter four is an account of the ruling class, who rules, 
what are they what and what for what ends do they rule and what are their i call it the ruling class and its armies identify three armies that support the ruling class but who are themselves not ruling the rulers chapter five is an extended analysis of immigration um, chapter six asks the question what if present trends continue so if they maintain power and keep doing everything they want to do what, what will the country look like and then chapter seven says well what if the present trends don't continue what if they break it where does that lead us and then chapter eight as i say is a kind of vote for trump so obviously that doesn't matter anymore um but what is still relevant in chapter eight is it's i give it it's my attempt to say this is what a second term should look like we didn't get that but it's what i would say nationalist populist policy going forward should look like whether that's at the fed or the state um level you know let, let's try to build policy around these lines so that's it eight chapters it's it's not a short book it's 400 some odd pages so yeah you are awesome and i so much appreciate your time and i so much appreciate everybody else's time uh thank you so much for um for allowing michael and i to be your guest and uh, i reached out to michael kind of urgently right because i'm like let's discuss machiavelli and thucydides and uh I, I really appreciate the time you gave me and you gave everybody else today. Can I ask you one closing question? Sure. Um, it's something I get a lot and I'm very reluctant to answer people because I can only tell people the books that I read, which is a lot of Machiavelli. I keep on rereading the same stuff. A lot of Thucydides, a lot of Plutarch because I, I really like Alexander the Great. I like Julius Caesar. Um, I really, I love them, right? Is uh, what books do you recommend uh, for people and not only for, for the adults, but what rec what books do you recommend kind of for kids to keep their intellectual pursuits? Um, for kids, tougher. No, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, the books that I enjoyed as a kid, I, you know, I was into Tolkien. I was into Lewis Carroll. Um, I was into, I'm trying to think what, what was I really reading? I mean, I was into like a lot of like kind of, children's lit type stuff, you know, I, there were sort of kid style detective stories and adventure stories that I was in. And most of those I don't really think back to anymore. The, the stuff that I remember reading as a kid that I still kind of have on the shelves that I still like, you know, it would be like Tolkien, Steinbeck. Steinbeck was big for me because I'm from Northern California. He's from Northern California. He's writing about places. Um, uh, Tom Wolfe, but I didn't discover Tom Wolfe until I think I was 19, 18 or 19. So sort of a kid, but in college i definitely was in college um and you know you wouldn't want to give tom wolf to someone who's like 10 because it's pretty vulgar lots of f words and um, sex scenes and things like that it's not nah, it's not young adult you know but uh, you can learn a lot and it's fun to read um to me the big three that i read over and over again are xenophon machiavelli and montesquieu they're my favorites and i teach them a lot but i also have learned them now i read thucydides i teach thucydides i teach plutarch I teach, you know, all the stuff that you're talking about. Um, they're my favorites. Um, but those are the big three. And then to understand Machiavelli, he has this vast library of sources that he uses. So you really need to know all the Roman, all the ancient historians to understand Machiavelli. Um, he, you have to, you have to really delve into Livy, uh, Tacitus, Suetonius, obviously Plutarch. And then the sort of the lesser Romans that people don't read that much anymore, the, or the sorry, the historians of Rome, like like um, Polybius, um, Dio Cassius, Dionysius of Hall Halicarnassus, Justin, Josephus, all of these, you know, I, I don't. Those are not ones that I turn to over and over and over again. I love that though, because from I, you have to read them to get Nick. And usually, if I'm studying him, which I have been lately, because I'm teaching a class on the Prince this semester. You know, I have to go. I always have to go back to the originals because he he never he's always misquoting. You know what I mean? He he if he cites a source, you can't take his word for it that he's telling you honest. Like when he talks about Hiero of Syracuse in Prince uh, six and in Prince thirteen, you have to go back to the original in Polybius and compare what Machiavelli says to what Polybius actually says, and you realize Machiavelli's totally manipulating you and lying to you. And then you have to wonder why does he do it. And if you don't go back to the original source, you will miss what he's actually, that he's playing with you. And he's trying to get you to think something through without telling you what it really is. Oh, wow. I just learned that. That's awesome. 
And now I'm a little bit upset too. But never uh, trust him. He's always he's lying constantly. If he quotes Livy, go compare it to the original because it'll be a misquote. He'll change something or he'll leave something out. And and it's up to you to figure out why. But, now, but you speak uh you speak Italian, don't you? You you learned Italian just so you could uh acquire I don't really speak it, I can read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to thank you so much for your time. You were awesome. I had so much fun. I had so thank much you. fun. So did I, I. I got to rip into your head a little bit. And uh, I want to thank everybody for allowing us to be uh, to be the guest on your feed and on your YouTube. And hopefully I got to a lot of your questions. And I know there was a lot here. So I couldn't get to everybody's. And my apologies. The Investor Series tomorrow is about nuclear energy. You're going to love it. I'm telling you. It's at 12 o'clock p.m. New York City time. Uh, it's one of Peter Thiel's company. It's the most exciting startup in nuclear energy. And it was founded by a woman, which I would never advertise as a, as right. a part of it. But I think it's kind of cool. I honestly genuinely think it's kind of cool. So I want to thank everybody so much. I see Deborah Stem is here. Thank you so much. Bo, 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 Lemon Minty, of course. Matt Carter. There were so many good questions here. Uh, and Lex Yussi again. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much, Michael, for making yourself available. I, just say, I see a question at the bottom that I can quickly answer. Somebody's asking, what's the best translation of the Peloponnesian War? I would get two. <laughs> um, the, one, the, the best one, in my opinion, is the one by Thomas Hobbes, the actual Hobbes, the Hobbes, the political philosopher, okay, who translated it in the um, early 1600s, I think. And it's still in print. Uh, it's the most accurate, but it's written like Hobbes. So if you've read Leviathan or Man and Citizen or something like that, like Hobbes' language is kind of, but I, I do enjoy it. Uh, an easier one to read that also has tons of maps that you can follow along is uh, Strassler, the landmark Thucydides, which is part of that landmark series of all the ancient military histories. The first one, actually, um, uh, that Strassler did. And uh, that's much more, uh, it's, it's a much more contemporary style of English, although I think it's not quite as um, as, as accurate as the uh, as the Hobbes translation. So those are the two that I that I use and can recommend. Thank you. And we're going to go back to your book. So it's going to be the closing thing. So the way this works is when I um, when we close up, which we're about to close up, the thing that's on the bottom, right, which is going to be this is going to be frozen. So when anybody sees this, that's always going to be there. Do you know what I mean? You'll see it. Uh, I want to thank everybody so much. I'm going to press the button. Everybody's going to go away, except for you, Michael. I want you to stay with me for an extra minute or two. Okay. okay. So I want to thank again, everybody, and, and especially you, Michael. You've been awesome. And you've taken so many questions from all over the place. Fun, though, right? Yep. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye. And I'm going to press the button now.